Chapter Forty Two of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Furniture beetles, bookworms, and death watches. In the days of timber built houses, much loss was caused by the borings of small beetles, which riddled the beams, floors, and wainscots, and often spoiled the furniture as well. Now that we build with brick and plaster, and paint exposed surfaces of wood, the ravages of these insects have been lessened to such a degree that few houses contain the worm-eaten timber, which was formerly so common and so vexatious. An attack of furniture beetles is indicated by round holes in the wood and little heaps of fine dust thrown out from them. The round holes lead to cylindrical burrows, which may run far beneath the surface, and in bad cases the strength of the wood is impaired. The hardest and driest wood is not safe, for boot lasts and the legs of chairs daily warmed before a fire have been attacked. It is the larva of the beetle which does the mischief. This is a whitish, soft-bodied grub, whose body is curved like that of a cockchafer larva. Its head, jaws, and small legs are the only hard parts, and also the only parts which show a distinct color. Observation of other insects might enable us to predict that the growth of any larva which feeds upon dry wood will be slow. Hardly any poorer stuff for food can be found, but the supply is inexhaustible, and the larva runs no risks. A furniture beetle has been known to pass three years in the larval stage. Contrast this with the history of a leaf-eating larva. Here the food is both more nutritious and easier of digestion. The time during which it can be procured is limited to the warm season, and many enemies await the larva. Its best policy is to feed without intermission and get the dangerous growing period over as soon as possible. We have seen that the larval stage of a furniture beetle lasts three years, and subterranean root-eating larvae, such as wireworms, may go on feeding as long or even longer. But the leaf-eating larva of the turnip beetle is full-fed in a week. When the end of its protracted feeding time grows near, the grub of the furniture beetle prolongs its burrow nearly to the surface of the wood, and here it is said, I cannot vouch for the fact, to spin for itself a cocoon of silk interwoven with particles of wood. Then it pupates, and in due course the beetle emerges, the thin barrier of wood which was left as a protective covering to the burrow being easily broken down. The beetle is three or four millimeters, one-eighth to one-sixth of an inch long, and of a dull brown color, varied on the sides of the body with grayish hairs. The head is bent downwards and sunk into the prothorax, which covers it like a hood. It does not appear when the insect is seen from above. The legs can be tucked under the body, so that it is a simple matter for the beetle, when alarmed, to sham dead, its rounded shape, inconspicuous color, and complete immobility, allowing it to pass for a mere pellet. The beetles often strike the wood of their galleries with their heads, and so produce a ticking sound, which is a call to the mate. The ticking is most frequent in the summer months, but in warmed rooms it may be heard at any time of the year. The commonest of our furniture beetles is called Anobium domesticum, or striatum. This is the beetle whose dimensions were given above. Another species, which is nearly twice as long, Anobium tessellatum, has very similar habits, and is the beetle which has been most frequently heard to tick. In the dead of night this ticking sound, distinct but inexplicable, strikes the mind with a vague terror, like the sudden cracks of dry timber or the dripping of unseen water, and what is really no more than the call of a minute beetle has come to be feared as a warning of death hence the name of death watch given to the anobiums and some other insects which make a noise like that of a watch the late frederick smith of the british museum tells us that having received two live examples of anobium tessellatum from mr doubleday with full instructions he tapped the table several times in rapid succession with a lead pencil when the beetles raised themselves on their front legs and bobbing their heads up and down struck the bottom of the box in which they were kept with their mandibles this performance he could set up almost at pleasure. The number of the taps was usually four or five. In the state of nature, the furniture beetles excavate living or dead trees, usually running their galleries in the sapwood. Quote, Notwithstanding the obscurity and retirement of their life, these wood-boring beetles have not managed to escape the attacks of parasites. Several species of ichneumon flies and other allied insects prey upon them and the delicate little gauzy-winged persecutors may sometimes be seen running about hither and thither over anobium-infested wood in maternal anxiety to find a suitable nidus for their brood. Some, too large to enter the burrows, are furnished with a long ovipositor with which to reach their victims, into whose bodies they insert their eggs. 
others are small enough to enter the burrows bodily and hunt their prey like a ferret after a rabbit. One of these latter, Theocolax formiciformis, superficially something like a minute ant, in consequence of the absence of wings, I have obtained in considerable numbers from a colony of Anobium domesticum, which had established themselves in an old aquarium stand." Unquote. From E. A. Butler, Our Household Insects, page 11, 1893. Anobium penicium, one of the furniture beetles, is also the weevil which devours ship's biscuit. It attacks all sorts of vegetable substances, wood, paper, and drugs of various kinds. There is another furniture beetle which now and then commits great ravages, especially in our southern counties. This is the Tillinus pectinicornis. It is of the size of Anobium domesticum and distinguished from it by the antennae, which are long and plumose in the male, shorter and simpler in the female. The grub of Anobium domesticum is not only a devourer of wood, it eats paper as well and is one of the so-called bookworms. Its burrows may extend from one neglected book to others on the same shelf, and Penot has recorded an instance in which 27 folio volumes placed side by side on the shelf were drilled through by one larva, so that a string might be run through the hole and all the volumes raised by the string. It is rare to find so straight a gallery as this, but we may often find torturous galleries several inches long. It is chiefly old books which are injured in this way, the general use of chlorine bleach paper, though a cause of decay in other ways, and the substitution of cheaper materials for linen rags have probably checked the ravages of bookworms. Several sorts of insects and a few animals of other classes deface or destroy books. Furniture beetles bore into the covers, besides running their galleries through the piles of unreadable pages. Cockroaches nibble the binding, and now and then the edges of the leaves. Silverfish gnaw the binding, and leave characteristic sinuous tracks. When the paper has been printed, they leave untouched the inked parts, so that a printed page becomes a tattered skeleton. A small mite, Chaletus erudis, has sometimes been found in numbers among books which have been stowed away in damp places, but it is really of carnivorous taste, and feeds not on the paper, but on the small creatures which lurk in the books. A chelifer, which might be briefly described as a minute tailless scorpion, is also found among neglected books, where it pursues its prey. So many insects attack large collections of books, and so great is the damage done by them, that it is part of the professional education of the librarian to know the marks by which the different kinds are recognized, and the methods of extermination appropriate to each. Fifty or sixty book-destroying insects and mites have been catalogued, and books have been written to describe them and explain how they are to be combated. Blades on the Enemies of Books is a well-known English treatise. The latest study of bookworms is Dr. Hulbert's Insects Enemies de Livre, Paris, 1903. Just as there are several different kinds of bookworms, there are several different kinds of death watches. Small insects, Atropis, belonging to the family of Sosidae, and believed to be allied to white ants, make a ticking very like that of anobium. Two species of Atropis are common in our houses, frequenting dusty recesses, neglected straw, old papers, picture frames, etc. They are often found on wallpaper. Both are so small as to require a lens to identify them. One kind, A. divinatoria, can be recognized by the vestiges of wings, which project as scales from the middle of the thorax. It has larger eyes than the other species, its length does not exceed one millimeter, and the legs of the third pair are much dilated at their bases. The second kind, A. pulsatoria, is larger, nearly two millimeters long, devoid of wings, and its eyes are minute. It is this second kind of death watch which makes such havoc in neglected collections of insects. Both divinatoria and pulsatoria produce a ticking sound, which is liable to be mistaken for the call of an anobium. It has been said that Atropus has no structures in its body sufficiently hard to produce an audible sound, and that even when the ticking sound is heard and the Atropus discovered, it is really an unseen anobium from which the sound proceeded. But the testimony in support of the ticking of Atropus is too strong to be overpowered by mere opinions as to what it can or cannot do. One of my friends, a very keen observer, traced the ticking sound on five different occasions to an Atropus, and in each case, as soon as the insect was removed, the sound ceased. If we are to retain the name of death watch at all, we must recognize that it has no scientific value. There are several species of ticking insects, and they belong to widely different groups. 
It is not difficult to abate the attacks of these small insects and to stop the destruction of furniture as well as the ticking sound. The infected object must first be discovered, and then an appropriate treatment can usually be devised. It is often most convenient to apply strong poisons in the form of vapor. If the infected object can be placed in a tightly closed case, together with a saucer of carbon disulfide or benzene, and left for a few days, the beetles and their larvae will be killed. The eggs, however, are not necessarily destroyed, so that a watchfulness is necessary to prevent a recurrence of the attack. In some cases, it is possible to wash the object with benzene or to plug the holes with furniture polish. Heat is very effectual, if it can be safely employed. A temperature of 80 degrees centigrade maintained for some hours destroys insects, larvae, and eggs alike. End of chapter 42. Chapter 43 of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Phases of Summer and Winter in England. The months may be grouped in a variety of ways, each with advantages of its own. To the naturalist, the most important primary division is into summer and winter, the leafy and the leafless seasons. If we seek to subdivide each of these, we shall find that bisection will not do. The solstitial periods cannot be halved, but a natural and useful division into three can be obtained. In this way we get six phases, which may be characterized as follows. Early summer, April to June, is usually a time of light rainfall. Crowds of flowers of the same kind, such as bluebells, red campions, and buttercups, bloom at once. Singing birds fill the air with their music. Flying insects are few and cause little annoyance except near pools of water. In midsummer, June to August, the heat and the rainfall on an average of years reach their maximum, though there is often a second maximum of rainfall in October. Flowers show their greatest variety. Many trees put forth their July shoots. Songsters are very few. Insects of all kinds abound. This is the principal aphis time. Late summer, August to October, begins about St. Bartholomew, August 24th, which, according to the proverb, brings the cold dew. Stationary, low-lying mists are common after sunset and before dawn. Calm, clear weather, with some haze, often prevails for weeks together. Many soft fruits and most of the small fruits ripen. Thistledown and other plume fruits are dispersed. Nearly all the birds are mute. Flies, especially in a hot year, are abundant and troublesome. Gossamer may be seen more frequently than at any other time of the year. Early winter, October to December, is usually wet and foggy. Cyclonic weather often prevails, and the rivers are in flood. Next year's buds are already fully formed on the trees. Nuts and many hard fruits ripen and are dispersed. The summer migrants depart. Insects are few. Midwinter, December to February, is the time for frost and snow. Vegetable and animal life is nearly at a standstill. Winter migrants arrive now or in early winter. Late winter, February to April, is usually a time of dry cold. The rainfall minimum is to be expected. The buds on the trees swell, catkins expand, early spring flowers bloom, being nourished by stores of food laid up in the preceding year. Summer migrants appear. Tadpoles are hatched. Humblebees, with a few beetles and flies, are almost the only insects to be seen abroad. Precision of date in the six phases is not to be expected. They begin approximately in the middle of April, June, August, October, December, and February, lagging considerably behind the chief events of the astronomical year. Leafage comes about a month after the spring equinox, the maximum of vegetation and insect life about a month after the summer solstice, defoliation about a month after the autumn equinox, while it is not till two months after the winter solstice that the annual cycle of growth can be said to be fairly set going again. The traditional four seasons are convenient for most purposes, and it is only when a rather more precise subdivision is desired that six phases, so called to prevent confusion, can be usefully distinguished. End of chapter 43. Chapter 44 of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Garden Spider, Epira diadema. Between the gorse brushes on a common, 
or the clumps of heather on a moor, or in the openings between the bushes in a garden, we often see a large and nearly vertical net with many radii, and what we may take at first glance to be circles intersecting the radii. If there has been dew or fine rain, the net becomes much more conspicuous, because of the small drops which cling to it. In the center of the pattern a large spider will probably be seen hanging head downwards. She is of chestnut or dark brown color, speckled with whitish spots, and on the back of the abdomen a white cross is plainly to be seen. There are many species of Apira, but only one shows the white cross. A pocket lens is sufficient to show the details of the garden spider's head. It is blended with the following divisions of the body, thorax, as in all spiders, and shows two sets of instruments, eyes to discern the prey, and jaws to grasp and devour it. The poison fangs, chelicerae, are two-jointed and close up like a clasp knife, each of the meeting edges being armed with sharp teeth. The duct of the poison gland opens near the tip of the terminal joint. Behind the poison fangs comes a second pair of jaws, which look more innocent, since they end in jointed and hairy palps. The base of each is shaped into a cutting blade opposable to its fellow and useful in mastication. Kirby and Spence, in their Introduction to Entomology, give an excellent description of the fabrication of a garden spider's net, and their description, supplemented where requisite by later observations, forms the basis of the following account. The first step in the formation of the net is the laying of the exterior lines, which pass in most cases from branch to branch and are composed of several threads glued together. These are secured at many points by finer threads. Having thus completed the foundations of her snare, the spider proceeds to fill up the outline. Attaching a new thread to one of the boundary lines, she travels along the circumference, drawing out the thread as she proceeds and guiding it with one of her hind feet, so that it may not touch surrounding objects of any kind. When the new thread has been carried half round the circle, she secures it to the boundary, stretching it diametrically across the center of the space. A second thread is laid down in like manner, crossing the first at its center, and after this the work proceeds rapidly, until twenty or thirty radii have been fixed. During these preliminary operations the spider sometimes rests, as though her plan required meditation, but no sooner are the marginal lines firmly stretched and the first radii spun then she continues her labor rapidly and without pause. Proceeding to the center, she pulls each thread with her feet to ascertain its strength, breaking any one that seems defective and replacing it by a fresh one. When satisfied about this, she leads a spiral line from the center to the margin of the net, the innermost turns being close together, but the outer ones much more open. This preliminary spiral is only a temporary scaffolding, to be replaced by a permanent spiral of different construction. Starting anew from the periphery, where the first spiral line ended, she draws a second spiral thread towards the center and glues it to all the radii as it crosses them. The thread is continued in gradually diminishing turns until the center is almost reached. Why, we may ask, should two spiral lines be laid down by the garden spider, one temporary and the other permanent? The answer is that in its final state the spiral line is meant to be adhesive, so as better to entangle flies, but a viscid thread is too slippery to give foothold, even to the spider that lays it down, and moreover, the viscid coating is injured whenever the spider steps upon it. Since the radii are too wide apart towards the circumference for the spider to step from one to another, she lays a non-viscid spiral line for her own use, and bites it away bit by bit when she passes over it for the last time. The original spiral line is not completely removed. Towards the center, a few non-viscid threads are left, and these constitute the watching station of the spider. Here she hangs head downwards by the claws of her hind legs, waiting for a victim, which cannot fail to agitate one or more of the radii and thus give her instant warning. The permanent spiral thread is coated with a sticky film, as we see by its retaining dust and adhering to the fingertip when lightly touched. When fresh spun, this thread has a uniform covering of fluid, poured out no doubt from special glands, though these have not been clearly identified. As soon as the thread is properly coated, the spider plucks each section like a harp string, and the vibration thus set up resolves the fluid into countless drops, too small to be seen by the naked eye. The sticky globules must not be confused with the much larger dewdrops, which are often seen on the web of an autumn morning. 
When exposed to sun and wind, the adhesive coating soon dries up. But Blackwall found that when the net was enclosed in a glass jar, the adhesive property remained unimpaired for months. When in full activity, a garden spider makes a new net every day, or at least relays the viscid spiral thread. Old spiders are not able to secrete so much silk and content themselves with repairing the net so long as it is in fair working order. Somewhere in the neighborhood of the net, the spider has her special retreat, concealed usually by the leaves of a bush, and into this she drags her victims, sucking their juices and throwing out the carcasses. A stout line of communication, composed of several threads glued together, leads from the center of the net to this retreat, and by its vibration gives notice to the spider whenever a fresh victim is caught in the snare. The male spiders, which are much smaller than the females, are usually to be found near the retreat. Blackwall describes the curious proceeding by which the garden spider and some other Epiras envelop their prey. When too large and powerful to be safely approached, threads are cut away until the victim dangles. It is then made to rotate by a touch from one of the spider's legs, fine threads issuing from the spinners being first attached by means of a cautiously extended leg. As the object revolves, it is speedily wrapped up in a dense covering of silk, which makes even struggling impossible. In this way, the garden spider deals with formidable insects, such as wasps. Her eggs are laid in autumn in a cocoon formed of a double sheet of yellow silk. There may be several hundred eggs in one cocoon. Leaves and other natural objects are often interwoven to give it an unsuspicious appearance. The garden spider often finds herself in a difficulty when seeking to run the first marginal threads of her net from point to point. The branches, which she desires to connect, may be high above the ground and too far apart for her to make her way from one to the other by any ordinary method. One of the authors of the Introduction to Entomology relates the following observations, which are here slightly condensed. Quote, I placed a large field spider, Epira diadema, upon a stick about a foot long set upright in a vessel containing water. After fastening its thread, as all spiders do before they move, to the top of the stick, it crept down the side until it felt the water with its forefeet, which seemed to serve as antennae. It then immediately swung itself from the stick and climbed up by the thread to the top. This it repeated perhaps a score of times. At length it let itself drop from the top of the stick, not by a single thread, but by two, one finer than the other. When it had nearly reached the surface of the water, it broke off the finer thread, which still adhering to the top of the stick floated in the air and was carried about by the slightest breath. On bringing a pencil to the loose end of this line, it did not adhere. I therefore twisted it once or twice round the pencil and then drew it tight. The spider, which had previously climbed to the top of the stick, immediately pulled at the thread with one of her feet, and finding it sufficiently tense, crept along it, strengthening it as she proceeded by another thread, and thus reached the pencil." Unquote. Many spiders which wander in search of prey are able to emit threads by which they can support their bodies in the air when a breeze, even a gentle breeze, is blowing. The example just described shows that the snare-making spiders also may possess the power of throwing out a line, which, though it may not suffice to raise the spider in the air, enables her to pass to a point which would be entirely inaccessible otherwise. The garden spider is guided in these operations entirely by her sense of touch. Blackwall tells us that he repeatedly confined garden spiders in glass jars placed in absolute darkness and found that, though unable to see, they made nets of admirable workmanship. What kind of feet does a spider require in order to run about on a network of fine silken threads? It is worthwhile to examine the foot of a garden spider or any other. You will find a pair of strong claws projecting from the upper surface of the last joint. Each claw is curved and armed beneath with a row of teeth. A third and smaller claw is found beneath the pair, and on close examination several more claws, each with a row of pointed teeth, can be made out. We see that the comb-like teeth are suitable for clutching at a fine thread, but the difficulty is to explain why so many claws are required. On the hind legs, and on them only, are opposable claws, which can grasp the thread as well as hook onto it. When the spider dangles from its thread, it always holds on by the opposable claws of its hind feet. The harvestman makes no web, but follows its prey over stubble and the slender blades of grass. 
Here you will find that the foot consists of a long series of minute joints, each with its own set of outstanding hairs. The whole series may be half as long as the rest of the leg. The extraordinary length and flexibility of such a foot are obviously adapted to support on a yielding surface. The harvestman, one might almost say, runs about on flexible snowshoes. The silk of the garden spider is employed by opticians in one of the most delicate parts of their work, namely, the quartering of the field of a telescope or theodolite. The garden spider, which is easily identified by the white cross on its back, is always selected. When captured and set on a wire fork, she attaches her thread and lets herself drop. The fork is then turned round and round so that the thread makes a number of separate turns round it. The prongs are next varnished to fix the thread at short lengths. A single thread can now be brought into its destined place, received into grooves cut for it, tightened and secured by a touch of varnish. Sometimes threads unwound from the cocoon of a spider are employed instead of fresh threads. In this case, the cocoon is laid upon water till it untwists, then it is laid across the prongs of a fork and secured as before. The best part of this short account of the garden spider comes from Kirby and Spence, and I think that some of my readers, especially those who already know and value the introduction to entomology, may be glad to be told who Kirby and Spence were. Kirby was a Suffolk clergyman, who before the introduction had made him widely known, had won distinction in the narrow circle of professed zoologists by his history of British bees, Monographia Apum Angliae, and his investigations of the structure and habits of Stylops and Xenos, very remarkable insects which are parasitic upon bees and wasps. So peculiar are they that Kirby, with general approval, made them into a separate order, Strepsiptera, which is still recognized, though it is generally believed that the Strepsiptera are beetles, which have become strangely modified to suit the exigencies of a parasitic life. It was a leading object with the authors of the introduction to demonstrate the wisdom and beneficence of providence as displayed in nature, and they were held to have succeeded so well that Kirby was afterwards selected to write one of the Bridgewater Treatises, 1835. The junior author, Spence, was a Hull dry salter. Before he published on insects, he was well known as the writer of some spirited tracts on political and economic subjects, such as his Britain Independent of Commerce, which was very widely read. Spence sought to convince people that Britain was more than a match for the whole power of Napoleon, that agriculture is the only basis of enduring national prosperity, and that British agriculture cannot flourish without the aid of corn laws. The introduction was published in four separate volumes between 1815 and 1826. It proved so interesting to the public that seven editions were called for during the lifetime of Spence, who outlasted his colleague by ten years. The authors owed much to earlier naturalists, especially to Réaumur, but they worked for themselves, too, and described many contrivances which they were the first to discover. A reader of the introduction will often find that Kirby and Spence furnished the most valuable part of some popular books on insects in which their names are barely mentioned. One would suppose, from examination of their separate writings, that Spence must have been the livelier writer of the two. When he was disabled by illness, Kirby wrote almost by himself the third and fourth volumes, and these are far less readable and less valuable than the first two. But the testimony of the authors does not allow us to give the credit of what is best in the introduction to either author separately. They declared that it was in every sense a joint work, and that it was impossible to distinguish the part which each had contributed. Their friends remarked, notwithstanding this protest, that whenever a particular anecdote or description was praised, Kirby was inclined to say that it belonged to Spence, and Spence that it belonged to Kirby. The introduction is of permanent value. It has helped to make many a naturalist already, and its virtue is not yet lost. Like the natural history of Selborne, it shows how profitable, as well as how interesting, it is to study our animals alive. End of chapter 44
Methods of Displaying Insect Structures to Many People at Once I wish to supply hints for a short school course on insects. Besides supplying information on insects as a class, I propose to show how the structure of an insect can be made evident to a number of pupils at once, and this is the difficult part of my enterprise. The methods which I recommend will, I know, seem too laborious to most teachers, yet they have all been carried out successfully in my own classroom, and I see no reason why they should not be practiced in some of the better equipped schools. An oxyhydrogen, or better still, an electric lantern, is required. The teacher should be practiced in the simpler methods of demonstrating and mounting insect structures. The life histories of a few common insects should also be rendered familiar by rearing the insects in breeding cages. I do not recommend this subject to all teachers, nor to all amateur naturalists. Some knowledge, skill, and experience are called for, and the study is better suited to a small class of elder pupils than to a large class of beginners. Many of the characteristic features of an insect can be seen by the naked eye or a lens of low power, but this is not quite enough. It is sometimes indispensable to examine minute parts, such as jaws or air tubes. We have found it a simple matter to fit a low microscope objective, two inches or one inch, to the lantern, and this makes it possible to show to a whole class at once every detail which is likely to be profitable to young students. We may, I think, anticipate that the facilities which the optical lantern affords will soon be more widely turned to account, and that the higher elementary schools, at least, will before long be provided with the means of demonstrating to a number of pupils simultaneously the most necessary details of animal and plant structure. An elementary knowledge of optics, or a few trials, are necessary to put the objective into its right place. The lantern objective is removed, and the microscopic objective substituted for it. A stage carrying the object comes outside the objective, and all the parts are placed as in the compound microscope when arranged for work. The next point to be considered is how to absorb a large part of the heat rays concentrated upon the object, which would soften the mounting medium or scorch the object itself. A glass tank filled with water was first used. This is liable to the objection that when the water grows warm, bubbles appear, and the water becomes more or less opaque to light. Glycerin was next tried, with far better results. My colleague, Dr. Stroud, suggested that the right liquid to employ is that which is used for mixing with the mounting medium. If, for instance, turpentine or wood spirit is employed to dilute the Canada balsam of the preparation, turpentine or wood spirit must be put into the heat-absorbing tank. The rays which are most readily absorbed by the mounting medium will then be absorbed in advance. We have tried this plan with excellent results and consider the heat difficulty as disposed of. The tank should be made in one piece, and the operator should remember that turpentine and wood spirit are very flammable. Our tanks were made by York Glass Company. It is a pleasure to acknowledge the skill and kindness of my colleague, Dr. Stroud, who devised the simple but excellent lantern microscope which we now use. The cockroach of the kitchen, which like the frog or the crayfish, is one of the martyrs of science, may be taken for a first lesson on insect structure. Distributing dead specimens to the class, we note the external features of an insect. The body is defended by an external armor, composed of a substance resembling horn in texture, but differing from horn in composition. This substance is called chitin. It is one of the very few components of the bodies of animals which can resist the action of boiling alkalis, however strong. For the sake of flexibility, the chitinous armor is divided into segments, and these segments are united by membranous junctions, where the chitinous covering, though not interrupted, becomes thin and flexible. The segments are grouped into three regions, head, thorax, and abdomen. There are three pairs of legs, one pair to each segment of the thorax. The head is furnished with a pair of feelers, a pair of compound eyes, and biting jaws, which will be seen very indistinctly in the whole cockroach. Along the sides of the body, in the thin membranes which unite the segments, are the breathing holes, or spiracles, but these cannot be well seen without special preparation. We can next show, by means of the lantern microscope, further details which require enlargement. The head of a cockroach may be prepared for demonstration in this way. Cut it off, hold it between the finger and the thumb, pass a scalpel into the mouth, press the edge upwards, and thus divide the head into a front and a back half. Boil these in a solution of caustic potash, 10%, for a quarter of an hour or more, then soak in water, changing the water now and then, 
until the potash is completely removed. Get rid of the water by soaking in methylated alcohol, afterwards in absolute alcohol, and lastly in turpentine. Mount in balsam, and the preparation is ready. Some days should, however, be allowed for hardening before any balsam preparation is put into the lantern. Watch glasses may be used to hold costly fluids like absolute alcohol. Put the front half of the head into the lantern. Observe the large compound eyes made transparent by the potash, the long many-jointed antennae, the mandibles with their strong tooth-like prominences, and the labrum, a flap which covers in the front of the mouth. A close observer can tell by the details of the antenna whether the head so displayed is that of a male or of a female cockroach. Next, put the hind half of the head into the lantern. Point out that there are now seen two other pairs of jaws called maxillae. The four pair of these are quite separate from one another. The hind pair are smaller and united at the base. Each of the four maxillae bears a slender, jointed palp, which is used by the insect to examine its food. How does the palp differ in the two maxillae? What are the most obvious differences between the feeding organs of a cockroach and those of a man, a snail, a crayfish, or any other animal known to the class? One of the legs may be mounted in the same way and shown by the lantern microscope or studied with a simple lens. Do not plague a class of children with Latin names for the joints of the legs, and do not name them at all unless you foresee that the names will be necessary, or at least convenient, in the present stage of your work. Extend the wing covers and wings if your cockroach possesses them. In the common cockroach of the kitchen, only the male has them well developed. The large American cockroach, which is now supplied by many dealers, has the wings well developed in both sexes. Note that the forewing, wing cover, is attached to the midthorax and the hind wing to the hindthorax. The wing covers, if well developed, are stiff and cannot be folded. When at rest, one overlies the other. The membranous wings are folded fanwise. The female of the common cockroach has short and quite useless wing covers, and instead of wings we find only a slight branch pattern, stamped, as it were, upon the back of the thorax. The upper half of a cockroach abdomen, which has been cleared with potash, may be displayed in the lantern. Observe the segments, the flexible membranes by which they are united, and the pair of jointed tails which project behind. The tails have probably some real use, but it would be hard to explain what it is. Some have thought that they serve as feelers in the dark recesses where the cockroach lurks and give warning of the approach of dangers from behind. In a cricket, they look very like a hind pair of antennae. The breathing organs of an insect are more easily demonstrated in a caterpillar than in a cockroach. It is easy to prepare a piece of the integument of one side, which will, with the help of the lantern, display the spiracles with admirable clearness. The branched air tubes may be exhibited either in the form of a microscopic preparation or a photograph from the same. The alimentary canal of a cockroach and a great part of its nerve cord can, if desired, be mounted as lantern slides. The simple lens is an excellent aid to the study of insect structures. A lens, magnifying five or six diameters and suitably mounted, is not expensive. White's of Wetzler makes a good one for eight shillings. But where handicraft is practiced, it is better to buy nothing but the glass lens and make your own dissecting microscope in the school. See Schoen's Through a Pocket Lens. The study of enlarged preparations and of living insects may be accompanied or followed by some such remarks as follow. What is an insect? An insect belongs to the large group of arthropod animals, which all have the body defended by a jointed chitinous armor. Not only the body, but the legs also are jointed, hence the name arthropod, which means with jointed feet. Among the arthropods which are not insects come the crayfish and other crustaceans, the spiders and scorpions, the centipedes and millipedes. An insect is sufficiently defined as a six-legged, air-breathing arthropod. The air tubes of insects. All insects are air breathers. It is true that some are so entirely aquatic during their early stages as to possess gills. The bloodworm is a common example, but every adult insect breathes by taking in gaseous air. The chief purpose of the wing stage in an insect is the dispersal of the eggs, and this purpose would usually be defeated altogether if the egg-laying insect could not range through the air. No insect breathes by taking in air through its mouth. The same thing is true of the greater part of animals. It is only vertebrates which breathe through their mouths. 
an insect has a row of holes along the sides of its body through which air is admitted or expelled. The holes, spiracles, are defended by valves and sometimes by an elaborate fringe of branched hairs, which not only exclude dust but water. You may have observed that when an insect falls into water, it does not speedily drown. Its spiracles exclude the air sufficiently long to give it fair time to wriggle out. Have you ever seen an insect breathing? A bee or wasp moves the joints of its abdomen in and out, bending or straightening them at the same time. Some other insects raise or depress the upper surface of the abdomen. Whatever the action, it has the effect of alternately enlarging and contracting the cavity of the body. It is not enough to provide a series of holes. The air must be forcibly driven along through them and along the air tubes into which they lead. For this purpose, it is necessary that the insect should be able to close the inlets tightly. Unless the air is put under pressure, it cannot be forced along narrow passages, and it cannot be put under pressure so long as it is free to escape. Just within the spiracle, the air tube leading inwards is made to pass through a clip, and by means of the clip, the air tube can be throttled at pleasure. This is always done before the body cavity contracts. The blood which fills the cavity transmits the pressure to the walls of the air tubes and drives the air into the ultimate recesses. Examination of the tissues of an insect's body shows that they are traversed and overlaid by air tubes, which branch continually until they become extremely fine. A thread wound spirally round every tube acts like the iron wire often used to line a flexible gas pipe. In both cases, the spiral thread prevents the tube from kinking when sharply bent. Insect Transformations One of the best known and most interesting peculiarities of insects is the transformation which so many of them undergo. Most of them pass the chief part of their lives as larvae or grubs and do all their feeding and growing in this stage. Then they turn to flies and lay their eggs. Many, but not all, pass through a resting stage just before they acquire wings. Two questions call for consideration at this point. Why should so many insects get wings before they lay their eggs? Why does a resting stage so often precede the wing stage? Wings are necessary, I believe, to all insects which are very particular about the place where they lay their eggs. Suppose that a particular caterpillar will feed only on the leaves of buckthorn. If the female moth lays all her eggs on the tree where she herself was reared, that tree will soon be overstocked, while there may be plenty of other trees of the same species which are untouched. It would evidently be far safer, if many generations are to be reared in succession, that the eggs should be laid a few together on a number of trees. Now a creeping insect could not manage this. It would exhaust itself to no purpose in seeking fresh plants. But if the egg-laying moth can fly, and if it is furnished with acute senses, it can make its way to plant after plant and distribute the eggs widely. It will be a work of time to lay eggs in a number of different places, and the moth which undertakes the task must be able to feed for some days at least. It would never do for her to depend upon the coarse vegetable food on which she subsisted as a larva. That would weight her body and interfere with her flight, besides taking up too much of her time. The sweet and nutritious juices of flowers are much more suitable. They can be sipped rapidly, and the weight is insignificant. Change of food brings with it a change of mouth parts. The insect discards the biting jaws of the caterpillar and acquires a new sucking proboscis. The sucking proboscis leads to yet further complications, for there will be an interval during which the old mouth parts are out of gear, while the new ones are not quite ready for use. Change of food leads, therefore, to a resting stage. But among the moss and other winged insects, we find one here and there which does not require to scatter its eggs widely, and such insects as these sometimes lose their wings altogether. The female vaporer moth is a well-known example. Here, the caterpillar is not at all particular about its food. The leaves of most garden shrubs and trees suit its taste. Moreover, this caterpillar can run about very well. In this case, therefore, all the eggs may be safely laid in one place, and the female need not fly at all. Evidently, her ancestors used to fly, for the stumps of wings can still be discerned on her back. The male vaporer flies very well, and both male and female still go through their resting stage. The size of insects. Insects are small animals. A very large beetle may measure four and a half inches in length, but this includes a long horn. One of the longest stick insects, so-called because the body and legs resemble dry sticks, 
may be nearly a foot long, but the weight of such an insect is by no means great. Some dragonflies are about six inches long, and there are some moths whose wings can expand to about a foot. None of these relatively enormous insects are found in this country. What the exact size of the smallest insect may be, I cannot tell. I have seen a full-grown parasitic fly escape from an insect egg, which was not distinctly visible to the naked eye. The small size of insects throw some light upon their extreme ingenuity. Being unable to defend themselves or to attack other animals by main force, they have commonly to use artifice instead. The disguises of insects are innumerable. They escape notice by their resemblance to leaves, sticks, bird droppings, and an infinity of other objects. They creep into crevices or spin together particles of sand, wood, leaves, and shells. Many of them, when alarmed, sham dead. Though few insects are formidable to other animals by reason of their biting power, many can sting, injecting a poison into the minute wound which they make, a poison which is far more dreaded than the wound itself. The Strength of Insects there is a widespread but quite mistaken impression that, if fair allowance is made for their small size, insects will be found to be the very strongest of animals. Kirby and Spence tell us that a cockchafer, allowing for a difference of size, is six times as strong as a horse, and they confirm the estimate of Linnaeus that if the elephant were as strong in proportion as the stag beetle, he would be able to level mountains. Such statements as these are based on the supposition that if one animal is ten times as long as another, it should be able to draw or lift ten times as much, but this is altogether fallacious. If the larger animal were identical in shape and build with the smaller one, it should be a hundred times as strong, while it would weigh a thousand times as much. The proportion of muscular strength to weight falls, therefore, as the size increases, and before long the animal would, as a mere consequence of increased size, become incapable of moving its body at all. It is only because the horse is expressly adapted to large size by its mechanical construction and actuated by muscles of far greater power that it compares so well as it does with an insect. If it resembled an insect in build and composition, we may safely predict that it could not even stand. The Abodes of Insects The versatility of insects is very great, as a glance at their places of abode shows. There are insects which live in the earth, on trees, in ponds and streams, in torrents, in the sea, in brine pits, on glaciers and snowfields, in hot springs which scald the hand. A small beetle will live and multiply for years in a bottle of argoil, crude potassium tartrate, drawing its whole nourishment from that uninviting substance. More than one insect finds its home and its food in the living colonies of the freshwater sponge. A leaf is not too thin for burrowing larvae of many kinds. Many caterpillars and fly larvae run their tortuous galleries between the upper and lower epidermis of bramble leaves, buttercup leaves, and many others, pupating in the excavated space and emerging as moths or flies, having accomplished their whole growth at the expense of a small fraction of the living cells which are contained in a single leaf. Insects and Honey Honey is a product worked out by insects and flowers for their mutual advantage. The flowers contribute more than the insects, for they can apparently make a little honey by themselves, but the cooperation of insects was necessary to the extensive and profitable natural industry which has sprung from such unimportant beginnings. Honey occurs in nature either as bee honey or flower honey. It is not known for certain that these two kinds differ in any material respect. The honey bee collects sweet juices from flowers, stores them in its crop and in large part of the gullet, and then disgorges them into a comb made ready for the purpose. One thing which makes us believe that the honey is not digested before being disgorged is that it differs so much according to the plants from which it has been obtained. Clover, heather, orange blossoms, labiate flowers, mint, rosemary, and the like affect the taste, smell, color, and consistency of the honey. Honey from poisonous flowers is sometimes itself poisonous. Such differences would not be likely to occur if the honey had been really digested. How did plants come to make honey? The possibility of such a thing arose when green plants found out how to decompose carbonic acid in presence of sunlight. Sugar then appeared in the cells and was ready to be excreted whenever a sufficient reason should exist. Various parts of green plants exude sugar, leaves, leaf stalks, etc., and the next step, namely the exudation of sugar at the base of the floral leaves, is not a very great one. 
If insects, attracted to the flower by the hope of pollen, happen to find honey as well, that would be a powerful motive for coming again. The flowers which had secreted the honey would get their seeds fertilized more readily than others, and thus would be founded that alliance between flowers and insects, which is now so well established that many flowers cannot set their seeds at all if insects are kept off by a muslin net. It only remained to bring the mechanism to perfection. The honey became more abundant, exuded only at the time when the pollen was ready for transference, and was not only protected more and more carefully from rain and marauders, but placed just where it would ensure fertilization. The perfume, which is so powerful an aid in attracting insects, is usually only the perfume of the honey itself. The insects on their side acquired an increased appetite for honey and increased expertness in finding it. Their crops enlarged. They learned how to make storehouses for their honey, using first of all, it may be, natural cavities, then cells of earth, clay, or impure pollen, and lastly, cells of wax. The wax was no doubt at first very impure and used very sparingly, as is still the case with the less expert insects. The most advanced bee communities use it in large quantities, though always with the most scrupulous economy. The process of wax making by hive bees leaves no doubt that they make it out of honey, how I cannot tell. Some palms and other plants are also able to make wax out of sugar. Upon the possibility of making wax and storing honey is founded the whole economy of the more complex bee societies. Ants, though they are fond of honey, have not got so far as to make wax. They early took a line of their own, gave up the regular exercise of flight, most of them losing their wings altogether, and thus, while gaining greater facility in underground work, relinquished all the chief advantages of a close cooperation with flowering plants. Flies are often honey seekers, and a few flies have powerfully affected the structure of certain flowers, but in general they are inexpert at this work, and seldom secure for themselves a monopoly of a particular source of honey, as bees and moths so often do. Injuries Done by Insects Long chapters have been written, among others by those excellent old naturalists, Kirby and Spence, on the injuries and benefits which we receive from insects. Nearly all our crops are injured by insects, and sometimes the injury amounts to destruction. We may see the gooseberry bushes stripped of their leaves year after year, apples often fall half-grown to the ground, or are cankered at the core as the result of insect attacks. Time would fail, even, to name the insects which prey upon the most useful of our plants. Let us just mention the locust, the wireworm, the turnip fly, and the various sorts of beetles called weevils as pernicious examples. Stores of grain, furs, skins, woolen fabrics, and other valuable products are continually ravaged by insects. The white ants of tropical countries and our native clothes moths are notorious for the mischief which they do. Certain insects cause great damage by their attacks on cattle, sheep, and horses, while a few are harmful or even deadly to man himself. It has been discovered of late years that malarial fevers are due to the bite of a gnat. When it pierces the skin to draw blood, the gnat introduces a microscopic parasite from its own salivary gland. In human blood, the parasite multiplies prodigiously, and by penetrating the blood corpuscles, sets up the fever. Other gnats, in turn, become infected by drawing blood from malarious patients, and so the round is kept up. It is probable that several formidable diseases are propagated by different insects. Benefits Received from Insects The list of benefits conferred by insects is not so long but it includes some that we could ill spare. Insects are one great agent for the destruction of corrupting substances of many kinds. In visits to sewage works, I have been struck by remarking how much putrid matter is turned into small flies and scattered harmlessly over the face of the country. Insects yield the favorite food of many birds and fishes, which we prize as useful or agreeable. Insects yield honey, wax, cochineal, lac, and silk. But I suppose that the chief benefit which we draw from the existence of insects springs from their activity in the fertilization of flowers. Many useful and beautiful plants would cease to ripen seed at all if it were not for the visits of insects. The Numbers of Insects More insects have been described by naturalists than animals of all other kinds put together, and many sorts of insects are extremely plentiful so that it is not unlikely that a majority of the animals now living on the surface of the globe are insects. The only doubt relates to microscopic creatures, far smaller even than insects, 
and nobody can at present even guess how many of these there may be. Insects and Man The surface of the earth is a battlefield on which a vast number of animals strive with one another for space and room. The advantage in this contest is by no means necessarily with the powerful. Numbers and artfulness have often prevailed over strength. It would seem as if the struggle was bound to remain forever undecided, were it not that in the last ages an agent of mighty power has appeared before whom many of the combatants seem unable to make an effective stand. The great beasts of prey die out where he establishes himself. Animals with hoofs and horns are enslaved by him and made to do his work. All creatures that interfere with his purposes find in him a steady enemy, whose plans are handed down from generation to generation. This enemy is man, who alone among animals can record his experience and take counsel with kindred whom he has never seen. There is no chance for the biggest and fiercest animals in rivalry with man. It remains to be seen whether or not the most insignificant of animals can hold out against him by reason of their numbers and the ease with which they escape notice. Somebody has lately been so bold as to propose that mankind should undertake the extermination of the whole race of insects, sparing, I suppose, the honeybee and perhaps one or two others of undeniable utility. Whether it is desirable to extirpate the insects or not, I will not consider just now, but will content myself with remarking that their prodigious numbers, their powers of flight, and their wide distribution make the task of extermination infinitely more difficult than any enterprise which man has hitherto accomplished or even undertaken. I have sometimes thought that in an isolated country like Britain it might be possible to exterminate a particular farm insect, at any rate for a time, by prohibiting for a whole year the growth of the crop on which it subsists. There are not many injurious insects which are absolutely restricted to one food plant, but there appear to be some. The difficulty which I foresee in extirpating a single species of noxious insects makes me very indifferent to a project for the extirpation of insects in general throughout the world. We shall have plenty of time to weigh the consequences before it becomes a matter of practical business. End of chapter 45。Chapter 46 of House, Garden and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vacation Rambles. The expansion of our towns and cities is ruining much that the naturalist loves. London has devoured many a pleasant wood and field. A little more than a hundred years ago, Queen Square, hard by Southampton Row, was thought to be a beautiful abode, because it commanded an unbroken view of Hampstead and Highgate. The naturalists of the first half of the nineteenth century looked upon Laystonstone, Tottenham, Highgate, Sydenham, and Blackheath as unspoilt country, where nature could be explored without hindrance. Our busy provincial towns grow with almost equal rapidity, I know of a little valley near Leeds, where in my own boyhood rare marsh plants and curious insects were to be found in undisturbed profusion. That valley is now crowded with forges, dye works, and back-to-back -back houses. Near Sunderland was once a delightful dean, where a bright stream flowed into rock pools, which filled with seawater at every tide. A singular mixture of marine and freshwater animals used to people these pools, but when I was taken to see them by their discoverer, Great ironworks smothered the place with ashes and smoke. One could relate such experiences at wearisome length, and to the naturalist, as to some few others, these changes are pure loss. He cares little for unexampled prosperity and increase of rateable value. The beauty and wholesomeness of human life, which he does care for, are not enhanced by such growths as these. Even the industrial development of the nineteenth century, though it has brought upon us cruel losses, has its compensations and it is the part of the philosopher to make the most of them. The compensation that I have now in mind is the vastly increased facility of locomotion which scientific discovery and commercial enterprise have placed at our command. As for the defacement of nature, if any words of mine could bring remorse upon the offenders, they should not be wanting, for I am persuaded that very much of this damage is needless. The Waysland between Antwerp and Ghent, densely populated and busy with machinery, is much of it fruitful orchard, in Saxony, only one percent of the soil is unused. The output of cotton, linen, leather, and machinery is so large that this little country is one of the chief manufacturing districts of Europe. Yet it is a pleasant land, a land of cornfields and fruit trees. 
I maintain that the manufacturer has no more right to trample underfoot all that does not help him to make a profit than has the man who is in a hurry to catch a train to push rudely aside the people who stand in his path. A little thought, some faint preference for what is beautiful over what is ugly, would spare us many of the worst injuries that are being done to our country. In the 17th and 18th centuries, besides those who traveled to earn money, only the wealthy, or those who had a passion for travel, visited any foreign land. There were plenty of young noblemen who made the grand tour with a tutor, visited France and Italy, and returned to show, quote, how much a dunce has been sent to Rome excels a dunce that has been kept at home, unquote. Here and there, too, there might be found such a singular example as that of Descartes, who, though only moderately wealthy and weak in health, contrived to visit every part of Europe which offered anything to a curious observer. Descartes wandered alone and almost furtively, for hardly more than a single friend knew where he was at any time. He particularly loved a pageant and would travel far to see a coronation. It is very remarkable that a man of his tastes, who had lived abroad half his life, should nowhere speak of any detail of foreign life, nor of any city or building which he had visited. That he should make no mention of striking scenery, although he had crossed the Alps and had occupied himself with the avalanches and other natural wonders of Switzerland, is less remarkable, when we consider what the readers of his day looked to find in any solid book. The descriptive traveller did not then exist, or used his talent only to gratify the curiosity of personal friends. Naturalists were among the first to discover how much they might enlarge their knowledge by travel. John Ray and his pupil Willoughby made many and long peregrinations, both at home and abroad. Linnaeus explored Lapland, resided long in Holland, and visited England. His pupils explored every land accessible to them. Sir Hans Sloane diligently collected the plants of Jamaica. Sir Joseph Banks, though a wealthy Lincolnshire squire, endured the hardships inevitable to a circumnavigation of the globe with Captain Cook. All these were men of exceptional energy or exceptional opportunities. The man who had his bread to earn was in the 18th century generally forced to remain at home round the year. Dr. Johnson saw the sea for the first time when he was 56 years old. His wife never saw it at all. George III, at 34, had never seen the sea, nor been 30 miles from London. I have described so much, said Richter, yet I die without having seen Switzerland or the ocean. Steam now makes it possible for many a busy man of small income to escape once a year from the cities which the love of gain has made unnecessarily sordid, and to visit lands which our fathers knew only by report. It is now not difficult for any one who has a long vacation to visit every country of Europe. Sir Henry Holland did more than this. During a busy professional life, he was a West End physician in large practice, he contrived to visit every capital of Europe, most of them repeatedly, to make eight voyages to the United States and Canada, to visit the West Indies, to travel four times in the East, thrice in Algeria, twice in Russia, besides making journeys to Iceland, the Canaries, and many other places far from home. The wonder is a little explained when we are told that he lived to 85, that he enjoyed a large income during nearly the whole of his life, and that he was able to leave London for two months every year, because nearly all his patients left London too. But the record, after all allowance has been made for favoring circumstances, is a remarkable proof of energy. Sir Henry had his reward. Foreign travel, joined to a hearty love of his kind, and a natural power of engaging the attention of noteworthy people, secured to him a kind of leadership in a very exacting society. I am almost sorry to have mentioned Sir Henry Holland's long career of foreign travel, for the excursions which I want to stimulate are more particularly such as men of small means, uncertain leisure, and length of days not greatly exceeding threescore years and ten can hope to enjoy. A man who accomplishes one-tenth of Sir Henry Holland's wanderings may be greatly exhilarated and enlightened by his foreign experiences. To break through the routine of home life, to taste unaccustomed dishes, to hear unfamiliar tongues, and desperately, it may be, to attempt to express our views or our wishes under every disadvantage of vocabulary, grammar, and accent, is one way of washing out the starch of respectability. It makes us more human, and gives us a brief chance of that independent activity which is too often impossible at home. The traveller is lucky indeed, whose attention has been called betimes to natural phenomena. Any kind of nature knowledge will brighten a ramble abroad, but according to my experience, geology and botany are best of all. 
The geological structure of a new country can be in some measure appreciated, though of course it cannot be set down during a rapid traverse. Much else turns upon geological structure, which governs not only the elevation of the land, its accessibility, the nature and position of the commanding points, but even in some degree the genius and temper of the inhabitants. History is largely affected by geography, and geography in turn by rock structure. Geology abounds in the kind of questions to which the traveler can profitably bend his mind, questions not too special or minute for a man whose thoughtful hours are few and precarious, and who can carry few books along with him. A decent provision of maps, such local descriptions as can be picked up in the nearest city, a geological hammer, and if possible a practiced eye are the chief requisites. They are all portable. Let a man survey the Campania from the windows of the Vatican, if he can get no nearer. He will wonder at the little towns, each perched upon its own steep and isolated hill, that start out of the sea-like plain. It is geological observation which tells him how these hills came to be there, and without some tincture of geology, the hills themselves, the historical incidents which belong to them, and even the paintings of Italian masters, in which such hills are often delineated, may fail to impress themselves adequately upon our attention. Or let a man visit Sweden, and observe the rounded knolls, great and small, which are not mere heaps of loose material, but bosses of solid rock, the perched boulders, the innumerable lakes, the long mounds of sand and gravel, and then ask himself why this kind of landscape, unknown in southern lands, should pervade large tracts of Sweden, Scotland, Ireland, and New England. Geology answers the question, which else would remain totally dark. Why do we rarely find in a northern land splintery peaks like those of the Dolomites, or sand-worn cliffs like those of Arabia? Here again, it is only geology which can tell us. Botany does more for the traveler than zoology, partly because the range of plants depends more obviously than that of animals upon geological structure and soil, and also because plants affect the scenery in a way that animals can never do. An inquiring naturalist will raise deeply interesting questions of plant distribution from very limited excursions, whereas it is only when studied on the continental scale that the geography of animals has proved instructive. But all branches of natural history are good. The bird man, the insect man, the naturalist of any good sort, I mean any naturalist who inquires, will find in every foreign land abundant opportunity of carrying his studies farther and giving them a wider scope. The reader has very likely taken his own line and knows perfectly well what he wants to work at the next time he has a chance of visiting an unfamiliar country. If so, I will wish him good luck and hasten to stand out of his sunshine. There are other tourists who are eager but totally inexperienced, and here and there such a one may be glad of hints which his forerunners have found profitable. To a young tourist with a taste for geology, who is about to visit Switzerland for the first time, I would say, do not waste your leisure and strength by speeding over a great tract of country. Take one river valley and work it well. There is none better than the upper R valley for a first study. Begin at Meiringen, examine the Arschlucht as an example of what running water can do. Work your way up to the Grimsel and then photograph the glaciated rocks till you have learned something of what moving ice can do. The Ober R glacier will teach you nearly everything that one glacier can teach. Afterwards, you can go on, if you are enough of a mountaineer, and cross the snowfields upon which the Schreckhorn and Finster Arhorn look down. That one valley will teach you more than all Switzerland could do if you were to move over the ground, as so many do at the rate of 40 miles a day, in a personally conducted party. To find out your own way, to puzzle out your own problems, and to work at your own rate are the first elements of productive investigation, whether you are trying to master the scenery of Switzerland or a new science. Of course, there are many people who find the only true method hopelessly slow. Switzerland in three weeks, chemistry in 20 lectures, is the program for them. They will learn in time that lasting knowledge is not got by such facile expedients. The rapid method is inviting enough at the outset. We go in a party because we love society. One of the party knows the way, while the rest do not. What then can be more natural than that he should lead? One knows the elements of a science of which the rest are ignorant. What more natural than that he should speak while the others listen? The answer is in each case the same. Knowledge that we get without personal effort is knowledge in appearance only. It strikes no root and soon withers. 
Most of the people who visit Norway do just what the naturalists should avoid. They steam up one fjord after another, smoke twice as much as they do at home, eat heavy and frequent meals with no better intervals of exercise than are possible on an encumbered deck, vary the steamer only by driving from one hotel to another, and are guided all the way either by bydecker or an experienced friend. This may be tolerable for the first week, but the second week is very like the first, and one fjord very like another. It is always somebody else, and not the tourist himself, who does whatever is done, manages the engine, manages the horses, cooks the dinner, chooses the route. A life like this has much in common with what I maintain to be the very poorest recreation that has yet been hit upon, watching a football match. To stand in a wet field on a winter day and see men play a match is an occupation that no man of any spirit could possibly endure. Let us do something or other, exercise either our brains or our muscles, and take our part in the fun. If any naturalist wishes to break away from the relaxing and too commodious fjords, but does not know where to go, I can put him in the way. An excellent alternative, more practicable than others which I could name, is to visit Kongsvold. Kongsvold is nothing more than a post-house on the Great North Road leading from Christiania to Trondheim. There, in the sight of the Snohetta, he will find hills, wild gorges, and such botany as it is likely he has never enjoyed before. The first glance at Knudsho, a hill close at hand, tells us that we are in a new country. The rocks are of white quartz and black augite. The vegetation consists of patches of sulfur yellow and a green so dark that at a little distance it looks black. When you come closer, you make out that the yellow indicates dense growths of lichens, the so-called reindeer and Iceland mosses, while the dark patches are clumps of dwarf willows, dwarf birches, juniper, and alpine bearberry. The delightful labors of the mountainside are sweetened by the simple hospitality of the station and by the friendly talk of the botanists, mostly Swedes, who assemble there every summer. I remember with special pleasure the conversation and help of the aged botanist C.J. Lindbergh, whose latest visit to Kongsvold I happened to share. The difficulty of language is the only one that embarrasses the Englishman. I have been reduced at times to bringing out the Latin of my boyhood, such Latin. Who that has ever rambled over the Dorva field would consent to go back to the coast steamers and the stream of tourists which flows along the fjords like water in pipes? Many of us are too busy to spend our holidays abroad. There is plenty to see at home, and you can make all that you see profitable if you will only form the habit of putting and answering questions for yourself. When you visit a castle set on a ridge, such as Belvoir, Richmond, Beeston, or Bamborough, Ask yourself how the ridge comes to be there. When you visit the Roman wall, look out for the natural feature which determined the choice of that particular line, and possibly gave the first hint that a fortification might be easily made there and easily defended. Do not sterilize your geological or natural history rambles by mechanical occupations such as aimless collecting or the writing out of lists of species. Half a dozen questions answered, nay, half a dozen questions attempted, may be more to the purpose than notebooks crowded with unproductive facts. End of chapter 46「Chapter 47 of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meol. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grasses. The Characters of Grasses. By what marks do we recognize grasses? I suppose that most of us would say that any plant is a grass which has long, narrow, pointed leaves, hollow stalks, halms, and small greenish flowers. So different are grasses from all other plants that we should have no hesitation in deciding whether a single leaf, a single halm, or a little cluster of flowers belong to a grass or not. When we look closely, it is easy to find further differences between grasses and other plants. The base of a grass leaf forms a sheath around the halm, which runs down the stem to the knot next below, and is nearly always split. Just at the place where the blade becomes free, there is a little colorless scale, which is in close contact with the halm. The leaf is generally ridged on its upper surface, and if we cut it across and look at the cut edge with a lens, angular ridges will be seen. The hollow halm, with knots at intervals, is almost equally distinctive. The flowers are usually very numerous, 
and very small, so that it is not easy to make out all the details, but in a flowering grass we can see two things which are peculiar, lightly poised anthers which hang out and dance in the wind, and long, slender, feathery styles. The only plants which come so near to grasses that a doubt can arise as to whether they are grasses or not are certain sedges and rushes. In these, the sheathing leaf bases are either wanting or not split, and there is no colorless scale. The stalks are commonly filled with pith, the anthers of the stamens are erect, and do not dangle as in grasses. The numbers of the flower parts are also in many cases different from what we find in grasses, where there are nearly always three stamens and two styles. There are many sorts of grasses, and about a hundred species grow wild in the British Isles. A very little attention will show that in every hayfield there are several distinct species with quite different flowers. Any grass that we happen to examine will suggest a number of questions, and it may easily happen that among these will be some that we cannot answer to our satisfaction. It is a good practice, however, to put questions incessantly, for it is chiefly in this way that we make progress in the interpretation of natural objects. Why are grass holms hollow and jointed? that is, with solid partitions at intervals. A hollow cylinder, like a grass holm, is better able to resist bending than a solid stem of the same weight for a given length. Take two lumps of plasticine or modeling clay of the same weight. Shape one into a solid cylinder. Spread out the other into a flat sheet and roll it up till its edges meet. You can thus get two cylinders of the same length and the same weight, one solid and the other hollow. Lay each upon two supports, the distance between the supports being the same in each case. Then test the power of the two cylinders to resist bending. A tape, holding up a suitable weight, may be hung from the middle point of each cylinder. The result will leave no doubt as to the greater resistance to bending of the hollow cylinder. For the reason of the different resistance to bending of the two cylinders, I may refer the reader to Round the Year article, Haytime. The hollow grass holm is light, strong, and springy, yielding easily to wind, without being damaged by it, except indeed when the seeds are nearly ripe, and the top of the holm is heavily loaded. Then wind and rain may lay the holms flat, but even for such an accident a remedy is provided, as we shall shortly see. Solid partitions or knots mark the places where the bases of the leaf sheaths are attached to the holm. Here the vessels pass out into the leaves, and it is chiefly the interwoven vessels which form the knot. The solid partitions stiffen the holm and hinder it from becoming flattened by pressure. But there is another and less obvious reason for the knots. Take an entire grass plant fresh from the ground and a foot or more in height. Plant it in a tray of wet earth or sand, not upright but horizontal, and see what will happen. A very top-heavy grass will not do. If the experiment is made with care and judgment, you will see in the course of a day or two that the hom begins slowly to erect itself. Each segment between two neighboring knots sets itself at a small angle to the segment next below, and as all the angles are bent towards the same side, the horizontal stem soon begins to rise. Before long it will be found to have completely erected itself, and perhaps to lean over a little to the opposite side. You can hardly fail to remark that all the bending necessary to erection is effected at the knots, and that the intervening parts of the stem are nearly straight all the time. There is evidently at each knot what we may call an organ of movement, compared to clover and wood sorrel. If you mark one of the knots with horizontal India ink lines passing round it a small distance apart, say one millimeter, you will see that in a day or two the lines become a good deal wider apart on the side from which the hom is bending. The organ of movement changes its form, swelling on one side, and either not swelling at all or swelling to a less extent on the other side. This power of swelling unequally, according to circumstances, is due to absorption of water. The knot, or some structure in communication with it, evidently possesses sensibility. It can feel, so to speak, when it is displaced, and absorb so much water as to bring the hom back to the upright position. Why do the bases of grass leaves ensheath the holm? While the grass holm is still growing, the outer leaf sheaths protect the inner ones, and the inner ones protect the holm. As the holm attains its full height, the inner parts are gradually withdrawn from the outer ones like the joints of a telescope, and the sheaths become free from one another. A young and soft shoot is stiffened, 
being made up of a nearly solid mass of sheaths, one within another, but an older and firmer shoot is hollow, light and springy, and needs no support from the leaf sheaths. No better plan could be devised for the rapid lengthening of the flowering stalks. Something, too, is gained by carrying higher the base of the free leaf blade, for to overtop its rivals is a leading feature in the policy of most grasses. Why are the sheaths of grass leaves split along one side? To permit of expansion without tearing as the parts within enlarge. The halm within the sheath rapidly expands in diameter as it becomes older. Sometimes a growing ear or mass of flowers is lodged within a leaf sheath and needs room for its expansion. Why are most grass leaves ridged on the upper surface? The ridges when cut across are seen to be more or less triangular and fit neatly together when the leaf is rolled up. Make a model of a grass leaf by gluing triangular bars of wood to a strip of canvas and see how neatly such a model can be rolled up or expanded as circumstances require. Nearly all grass leaves are rolled up in their early stages of growth, and even when full grown they may require to be rolled up as a temporary protection against hot sun and dry air. Some of our native grasses growing on dry pastures, such as Cicleria, can roll or unroll in a few minutes. It is enough to put a bell glass over the growing plant to cause the leaf to open widely, as it always does when the air contains much moisture. If we remove the bell glass and expose the plant thereby to the warm, dry air of an ordinary room, the leaf will roll up again and expose a diminished evaporating surface. Some grasses, like the mat grass of our moors, nardus, or the sheep's fescue, grasses which inhabit places where there is no shelter from the sun and wind, are permanently inrolled. Others, which grow in damp meadows or shady woods, never roll up when they have once expanded. A few grass leaves are flat and have no ridges at all. The stomates of a grass, that is the pores by which water vapor is given off and air taken in, often lie only on the upper surface of the leaf, within the grooves between the ridges. Hence they are well protected from too dry air, especially when the leaf is wholly or partially rolled up. If the leaves are flat, the stomates are usually found on both surfaces. In certain cases, this concealed position of the stomates protects them against an opposite but equally dangerous accident, that of being choked by water, which would prevent gas or vapor from passing in or out. You have no doubt often seen the float grass, Glyceria flutens, rooted in the mud and spreading out its leaves, which are sometimes yards long, upon the surface of a pond or a slow stream. The leaves of float grass lying flat on the water could not, if they possessed the ordinary leaf structure, drain off the rain, and if they happened to get splashed or drawn beneath the surface by a current, we might suppose that they would find it very hard to get dry again. But no such difficulty is met with. The leaf of the float grass, no matter what is the state of the weather, no matter how roughly the leaves have been treated, is always dry on its upper surface and always wet on its under surface. The dryness of the upper surface is due to the deep furrows between the ridges, and to these the surface film of the water cannot pass. See Object Lessons from Nature, Part 2, pages 135 and 6. And the water above the surface film is accordingly held up and prevented from entering. No accident to which the float grass is exposed can fill the furrows with water or drench the stomates which lie sunk in them. There is another glyceria, almost equally common in watery places. In this second species, Lyceria aquatica, the leaves never float, and it is interesting to remark that they have no ridges on their upper surface. It is probable that grass leaves originally became ridged on their upper surfaces to facilitate rolling up lengthwise during seasons of drought, but float grass has turned its leaf ridges to account as a means of preventing the wetting of the stomate-bearing surface. A cross-section of the leaf reveals a number of enclosed air spaces, which, one would think, must greatly increase the buoyancy of the floating leaves. However, in the second species of Glyceria, G. aquatica, whose leaves do not float, the air spaces are much larger. They are not simple cavities, but are filled with stellate cells. This was pointed out to me by Mr. Norman Walker in sections of G. flutens. Mr. Luton Brain, Transactions of the Linnean Society of London, 1904, says that the low ribs of G. flutens probably have no significance as an adaptive character. I suspect that he has not seen sections through floating leaves, where the ridges are as sharp and distinct as possible. 
In aerial leaves of the same species, the ridges are much lower, especially in the neighborhood of the midrib. What is the use of the colorless scale which is found inside the leaf sheath, just where the blade becomes free? I have puzzled over this question for years without the least success. Some people think that the scale hinders water from making its way into the sheath. It is an objection to any such explanation that the surface film of water cannot pass into narrow spaces bounded by unwettable surfaces, so that a scale does not seem to be necessary to hinder it from passing in here. I took three common grasses, cut off the leaf blades and their scales, ligules, and immersed them in water. No water made its way into the leaf sheaths. The scale is very constant in true grasses and peculiar to them. Why do the anthers of grass flowers dangle? In order that the wind may shake the pollen out of them more easily. In hay time, the air carries everywhere the minute pollen grains of grasses, and at this season, the dust which settles in still places always contains grass pollen. Grasses are wind pollinated. Why are the styles of grass flowers long and feathered? In order that they may have a better chance of catching some of the pollen grains which are wafted past by the wind. Why are grass flowers small, inconspicuous, and greenish? Because the grass has no need of insects or other animals to pollinate its stigmas. Remark the differences between a flower which is wind pollinated and one which is insect pollinated. We may take any common grass as an example of the first kind. Red clover, primrose, convolvulus, rhododendron, and orchids are familiar examples of the other kind. Wind pollinated flowers, one are inconspicuous, two are scentless, three secrete no honey, four produce much pollen, most of it being wasted, and five often have feathered stigmas. Insect pollinated flowers are one, usually conspicuous, two are often scented, three usually secrete honey, four produce less pollen, comparatively little being wasted, and five usually have simple stigmas. In certain states of the weather, grass leaves exude much water. There are fissures in them by which drops of water can be passed out. It seems that a low temperature is particularly dangerous to green tissues which are laden with water. During a warm day when rain has saturated the earth, absorption of water goes on freely. Even after sundown, the ground may still be warm enough to favor rapid absorption by the roots, but the air cools fast, and a temperature low enough to be dangerous to the softer tissues may obtain only a few inches above the warm soil. Under such circumstances, grasses and other herbs pass out the water, which has become superfluous and even dangerous, in the form of big drops. Then people generally say that there has been a heavy dew, though it may be that the sky was overcast and that no dew whatever fell. Exuded water may be distinguished from real dew by attending to two points of difference. Dew never forms except under a clear sky. Exudation takes place whenever plants gorged with water are exposed to cold air, whether the sky is clear or cloudy. Secondly, dew forms as minute, close-set drops, which on a surface not easily wetted may afterwards run together to form big drops. The drops exuded from the water pores of leaves, on the other hand, are big and solitary from the first. The exudation of drops from grass leaves can be brought about at pleasure. Cut a sod, damp it, lay it on a glass plate, and cover it with a bell jar. In a day or so, the grass, kept at the temperature of an ordinary room, will exude abundantly from the leaf tips. End of chapter 47「House, Garden, and Field」by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Water Spider A very ingenious predatory animal, which makes use of the properties of the surface film of water to construct for itself a home beneath the surface, is the water spider, Argyronetta, of which Professor Plateau has given a full and interesting account in the Bulletin Académie Royale de Belgique, 1867. Like all spiders, this is an air-breathing animal. It dives below the surface and spends nearly its whole life submerged. In order to do this without interruption to its breathing, the spider carries down a bubble of air which overspreads the whole abdomen as well as the underside of the thorax. These parts of the body are covered with branched hairs, so fine and close that the surface film cannot pass between them. 
the spider swims on its back, and the air lodges in the neighborhood of the respiratory openings, which are placed on that surface which floats uppermost. When the spider comes to the top, as it does from time to time to renew its supply of air, it pushes the abdomen out of the water, and we can then see that this part of the body is quite dry. When it sinks, the water closes in again at a little distance from the body, and the bubble forms once more. It would be inconvenient to the water spider to be obliged to come frequently to the surface for the purpose of breathing. A predatory animal on the watch for its victims must lie in ambush close to the spot where they are expected to appear, and the water spider accordingly requires a lurking place filled with air beneath the surface of the water. It has its own way of supplying this want. Relying on the fact that the surface film of water will not readily pass through small openings, the spider proceeds as follows. It begins by drawing together some water weeds with a few threads in such a way that they meet at one or more points. It then fetches from the surface a fresh supply of air and squeezes part of it out by pressing together the bases of its last pair of legs. The bubble rises, but is detained by some of the threads previously spun across its path. Then the spider returns to the surface to fetch another bubble and repeats the operation as often as may be necessary. Now and then she secures the growing bubble by additional threads and before long has a bubble nearly as big as a walnut enclosed with a silken invisible net which imprisons the air as effectually as a dome of glass would do. The spider takes care to conceal her home from observation and before long the minute algae growing all the more vigorously because of the air brought to them altogether hide the habitation. The mouth of the dome, which is of course beneath, is narrowed to a small circle, and then the spider constructs a cylindrical horizontal tube, seven to eight millimeters in diameter, by which she is able to enter or leave her home without being observed. The air within is renewed as required by the regular visits of the spider to the surface. Besides this home, which is the ordinary lurking place of the spider, another is required at the time when the young are to be hatched. The newborn spiders are devoid of the velvety covering of hairs and would drown if placed in a nursery with a watery floor. The female spider therefore makes a special nest for this occasion, a strong bell-shaped nest which floats on the surface of the water and rises well out of it. The upper part is partitioned off and contains the eggs. Beneath the floor of the nursery, the mother takes her station, ready to defend her brood against predatory insects. Where animals of a terrestrial air-breathing stock become adapted to a submerged life, forms less perfectly equipped for aquatic conditions will usually be found among allied species. We know of insects so entirely aquatic in their early stages that they quickly perish when removed from the water, and many gradations can be found to lead from these to purely terrestrial forms. In the same way, there are several spiders which connect the water spider with ordinary hunting spiders. One of these is Dolomitis, which used to be found in our fen country. The female is large, being 20 millimeters or four-fifths of an inch long, and therefore much bigger than a house spider. The male is much smaller. They run about on the surface of standing water and dive when pursued. But Dolomitis has not learned how to make herself a crystalline home beneath the water, a home whose walls consist of nothing more substantial than the surface film which forms wherever air and water meet. End of chapter 48。Chapter 49 of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meol. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Industries of Wild Bees. A. The Burrowing Bee. Almost any day in early summer, I can amuse myself by watching the industry of a burrowing bee, Andrina, which abounds in my garden. It is a little smaller than a hive bee, but so like it in general appearance that it might easily be taken for one. The observer's attention will probably be first roused by seeing the Andrina enter the ground, or it may be by seeing the little heap of sandy earth which it throws out of its hole, for in early summer this bee is a great excavator and throws out earth many times exceeding the weight of its own body in the course of a few hours. In dry, sunny April days, the work gets on fast, and a mound of fresh earth and sand forms close to the hole, which is almost big enough to admit a lead pencil. The bees often leave their burrows and come back again. When they return, their hairy bodies, especially the hind legs, are dusted all over with pollen, and the microscopic examination of this pollen shows that they have been visiting sallows, dandelions, gooseberries, 
and other early flowering plants. We cannot see how the burrowing bee combs off and collects the pollen. That is done in the dark. No lump of pollen, such as is conspicuous on the hind legs of a hive bee or a humble bee, is ever seen upon the andrina. The pollen, mixed with honey pumped up from the crop, is stored within the burrow. It is not difficult to explore the burrow if plenty of time is allowed. A straw or other flexible stalk is useful as a guide. The narrow gallery bends this way or that to avoid stones, runs level or descends according to circumstances, branches occasionally or frequently. The species differ in this respect. Andrina fulva, which I have chiefly observed, makes burrows which seldom branch, and attends a length of from a foot to a yard, though not descending more than a few inches into the ground. Sometimes the bee happens to break into the deserted burrow of an earthworm and follows it for a while, but the earthworm generally works too deep for the bee, which seldom gets more than a few inches from the surface. Towards the further end of its gallery, the bee excavates one or several cells, which are nothing but short and slightly enlarged side branches. In these she lays the burdens of pollen and honey brought back from the fields. One cell will contain a rounded pellet, as big as a small pea, and upon this a single egg is laid, which quickly hatches and yields a white grub, whose whole store of food is the pellet provided by the mother. Neither the galleries nor the cells have any special lining. Male bees are now and then seen hovering about the entrance to the galleries, but it was long before I learnt to know the males of the species, which is so common in my garden. They are smaller than the females, and differently coloured, and seem to spend most of their time about the flowers, gathering honey or pollen, but storing none. Many andrinas make their burrows near together, and a sloping bank or garden walk will sometimes show scores or hundreds of holes within a few square feet. The bees seem now and then to enter the wrong holes, for they creep out again in a minute or less, with the pollen still dusting their bodies. I do not, however, believe that they really make a mistake. The bee on entering finds an intruder in her burrow, a parasitic bee of which more will shortly be said, and being of peaceful disposition, she waits till the way is clear. There is no reason to suppose that several bees ever share the same burrow by mutual consent. When the cells are stored with honey and eggs, the bee shovels part of the earth back into the hole, makes up the mouth, and then probably sets about a fresh hole, as we may infer from the small numbers of eggs in one gallery, and also from the fact that the excavations are carried on for many weeks, while a single gallery can be excavated, stored, and closed in a few days. The advantages of the burrow are obvious enough. The andrina gets a tolerably dry place in which to store her honey and eggs, and some degree of protection from ants and other predatory insects, as well as from the innumerable insect parasites, which are ever ready to appropriate either food or larvae for the maintenance of their own young. The protection against parasites is, however, far from complete. When the mother bee visits the flower, the hairs on her body are often grasped by the minute larvae of stylops, which lurk there for this very purpose. She unconsciously brings home an enemy, which will enter the body of one of her brood and develop there, causing pain and distortion, though not necessarily death. Also, there are cuckoo bees, not unlike the burrowing bees in general build, which cannot dig or collect pollen or lay up stores of food. They find out the burrows, enter them, and lay their own eggs in the cells. The larvae hatched from these eggs get the start of the rightful owners, and it is not the offspring of the industrious burrowing bee, but of the cuckoo bee, which ultimately enjoys the store of food. Though the cuckoo bee is quite unlike an andrina, it is allowed to enter the burrow without opposition, and the andrina never learns the fate of the brood which she left to all appearance well provided for. B. The leaf-cutting bee. I will next describe the maneuvers of another solitary bee which I have lately had an opportunity of studying. We not unfrequently find that the leaves of trees and shrubs in our gardens have been mutilated in a singular way. Oval or circular pieces have been removed by clean cuts, which look as if they had been made with a pair of scissors. What creature cuts bits out of the leaves, and how is the cut made? A bright summer day given up to the inquiry will probably answer these questions. You will, if fortunate, see a bee, very like a hive bee, but rather stouter, hover about the tree, settle on a leaf, and cut out a piece with her jaws. While cutting, the bee clings to the piece which is to be detached. She cuts decisively and rapidly, doubling the fragment between her legs as she proceeds, and using her wings when the support begins to fail. Then she flies off, carrying the piece, which may be oval and a half an inch long, or circular and a quarter of an inch in diameter. 
the bee will probably come back again and again, get more bits of leaf, and fly away with them. If your garden is of the modest dimensions common in cities, you will be probably unable to see where the pieces of leaf are taken to. But in a large garden, you may find it possible to follow the bee and see her enter a hole, either in the ground, or in a wall, or in a tree trunk. Then you will be able to learn something more. After many journeys, each resulting in the acquisition of a single bit of leaf, the bee changes her occupation. Her journeys become longer, and she returns home with no load that you can see. After some days she will leave the spot altogether, and then curiosity will naturally lead you to examine the hole and see what it contains. Carefully exploring, you will find in the hole a cylinder, perhaps four inches long, made of bits of leaves wrapped one round another and pressed tight against the wall. If the tube is quite fresh, the bits of leaf will uncoil when removed, but if several days have passed since they were introduced, the tube will keep its shape. Gently unwrap part of it. You will find that it is carefully formed of several layers of leaves, and within are six, seven, or more cells arranged in a row and filling the whole length of the tube. Each cell is thimble-shaped and consists of leaf fragments arranged in several layers. One end is a little narrower and rounded, the other end is wider and closed by a neat lid composed of two or three circular leaf fragments. Beyond this lid is a shallow open mouth which receives the end of the next cell. The cells are all made separately, and though they fit the outer tube closely, they are not fastened to it. It is therefore possible to unroll the tube and leave all the cells intact. Within each cell is a mass of honey and pollen, with an egg or a larva on the top. Further study brings to light many more details. The leaf-cutting bees are of several species, and each has its own preferences. Some prefer one kind of hole, others another. Some prefer rose leaves, others lilac leaves, elm leaves, or horse chestnut leaves. They have their favorite flowers, too, which they visit for honey and pollen. The leaf-cutting bee, which is most plentiful in London gardens, finds or makes its burrows in the trunks of oak, elm, and mountain ash. I have no proof that the leaf-cutting bee ever makes her own burrow. It generally lines the burrow with elm leaves and gets its honey and pollen from thistles. The bee, which cuts up the leaves of rose trees, generally makes its holes in brick walls or in the ground. The leaf fragments are not cut at hazard. Each has a shape suited to the place which it is destined to occupy. The outer tube is more roughly shaped than the cells, which are beautifully exact. Every cell contains from nine to twelve separate pieces, sometimes many more, and though they are secured neither by stitches nor glue, they keep their shape perfectly. The fitting of the circular lids, each made up of three or four bits of leaf, into the mouth of the cell is an excellent piece of work. The bees often employ the disused burrows of earthworms, but are careful to stuff up the lower part of the tube with fragments of crumpled leaves, lest an enemy should enter from below. Some employ the holes excavated in tree trunks by beetle larvae or wood wasps. If the hole is wide, they will arrange their cells in two or three rows instead of a single row as usual. When all the cells are filled, the bee makes up the entrance with crumbled leaf fragments and comes back no more. The grub consumes its store of honey and then enters upon its winter sleep, pupating in autumn or spring, but never emerging until the following summer. I can only glance at a number of other contrivances employed by other solitary bees. Various species of osmia utilize stacked reeds, burrows of other insects, and even snail shells for their stores of food. Some bees employ the dead branches of blackberries, which are easily hollowed out because they are filled with soft pith. One species makes a collection of cells out of chewed leaves. Another not only employs empty snail shells, but conceals them in a dense mass of sticks and straws. Mason bees build up tubes of small stones, which they fasten together with a secretion which sets hard like cement. Helictus makes a rude comb of cylindrical cells out of clay and lines them with hardened saliva. The carter bee, Amphidium, strips off the woolly or cottony covering of certain herbs and lines her burrows with it. Other carter bees imitate the species of osmia, which chooses snail shells for its nest, but subdivide the cavity by partitions of resin. Dasypoda improves on the methods of Andrina, and instead of leaving a conspicuous mound of loose sand and earth at the mouth of the burrow, disperses it with her feet, lest it attract the notice of a spoiler. C. Humblebees Let us next consider the economy of the humblebees, 
which show a distinct advance upon the simple arts of the solitary bees. In early summer we see big humble bees flying abroad and at times exploring the holes in a stone wall or a bank of earth. The large black and yellow humble bee is probably Bombus terrestris, which makes a subterranean nest. The moss carding bee, B. muscorum, is much smaller and has a reddish thorax and a yellowish abdomen. The fierce B. lapidarius, which makes its nest among loose stones, is about as large as B. terrestris, but has the end of the abdomen reddish brown. The moss carding humble bee, B. muscorum, does not usually burrow, but makes its nest on the top of the ground in meadows or among trees. Here they are often cut through by the scythe and picked up by the mowers. There is no readier way of getting to see these nests than to visit a meadow that has just been cut. A nest may be five or six inches in diameter, of low rounded form, with arched roof, and concealed by moss, ferns, grass, or dead leaves, which are carefully arranged so as to give the outside as natural an appearance as possible. A narrow gallery, covered with moss or the like, and often several inches long, guards the entrance. The moss which covers the nest is never brought from a considerable distance, nor do the humble bees ever carry it through the air. They push it backwards towards the nest with their legs, the head of the bee pointing away from the nest. With their legs also, the bees card or tease out moss or other vegetable tissues, reducing them to the condition of fine threads, which are employed to conceal or to line the nest. Several bees have been seen to work together in carding moss or passing it towards the nest. If the nest of the moss-carding humble bee is dug up, which may be done safely, for this bee is very pacific, there will be found a lining of coarse wax no thicker than writing paper, and within this an irregular mass of egg-shaped cells, some open, others closed. They are of different sizes and of different shapes, and rather rudely fitted together. Some contain larvae and pupae in different stages of growth. A few contain honey only, and these are deeper and open at the top. Other cells will perhaps contain pollen saturated with honey, and lumps of the same substance often lie about the cells in a disorderly way. Schoolboys are often clever at digging out the nests of this and other humble bees, and the taste of the wild honey, mixed perhaps with a good deal of earth, is to many of us a familiar recollection of our boyhood. The nest of Bombus terrestris, one of the commonest of the burrowing humblebees, are lodged in underground cavities. It is believed that the deserted burrows of small quadrupeds, such as voles, are taken advantage of to save labor in excavation, but the humble bees may often be seen working at their own holes or shaping and trimming holes which they found ready-made. The red-hipped humblebee, B. lapidarius, makes choice of a cavity in a loose heap of broken stone or in a bank. The plan of construction adopted by Bombus terrestris is much like that of the moss-carding bee. The cavity, or some part of it, is lined by a thin layer of wax, which encloses the cells. These may be few, especially in early summer. When the nest is most populous, a hundred or more may be counted. The early cells made by the solitary queen are comparatively rude and consist of lumps of pollen coated with wax and enclosing many eggs or larvae. The workers, when they appear, construct cup-like cells as big as peas, in each of which the queen lays several eggs. Then the cell is stored with food, pollen moistened with honey, and closed. The grubs which issue from the eggs consume the store of food and then require to be fed, the mother bee, or at later time one of the workers, bites a hole through the waxen wall and passes food in from her own mouth. The common cell, shared by six or seven larvae, steadily grows till it is as big as a walnut, and Pierre Hubert ascertained that the grubs break through the wax from time to time when the workers clap more wax on the spot and trim it neatly. As soon as the grubs are full fed, they spin egg-shaped cocoons of whitish silk. The silken threads are often intermingled, so that several cocoons loosely cohere. When they perceive that the cocoons are ready, the workers remove the outer shell of wax. After the short pupal stage is over and the winged bees have emerged, the cocoons are seen to be truncated, a large circular hole having been made towards the upper end. The empty cocoons are trimmed, coated with wax, and filled with honey by the workers to serve as honey pots. They are deepened to increase their capacity by a rim of wax added to the lip of the truncated cocoon. 
Then the mouth is narrowed, but not sealed. Sometimes waxen honey pots are made of wax throughout, with no cocoon as a foundation. As many as sixty honey pots have been counted in one nest, and most of these may be full, but when many larvae are being fed, the store of honey runs low. The humble bees are much better equipped for pollen collecting than any of the solitary bees. The first joint of the tarsus of the hind leg is dilated, as in a hive bee, and its inner surface, the one turned towards the body, is closely set with short, stiff bristles, which are very useful in combing the pollen from all parts of the body. Just above the tarsus, and on the other side of the tibia, is a pollen basket, enclosed on either side by long, stiff, curved bristles. Captured humble bees will often be found to have a big lump of yellow pollen stored up in this basket. In one respect only is the collecting apparatus of the humble bees distinctly inferior to that of the hive bee. In the hive bee, the enlarged joint of the tarsus has the bristle set in regular transverse rows, and their efficiency in combing the hairs is thereby increased. In the humble bees, no such arrangement can be discovered. Humble bees employ wax rather sparingly either to line the nest or in the construction of their cells, and often mix it with vegetable substances. Their wax is made in much the same way as in the hive bee. The bee begins by taking a good meal of honey. Shortly afterwards, wax begins to exude between the joints on the underside of the abdomen and also on the back. In the hive bee, the wax is secreted in the form of rather large, thin plates, which can be detached by the nipper, a kind of forceps formed by the meeting of the tibia and tarsus of the hind leg. In a humble bee, the wax is much less coherent and does not form plates, but a kind of dust. No nipper is therefore required to detach it. At the base of the tarsus of the hind leg, we find, in place of the lower lip of the nipper, a short, stiff brush, which is apparently employed to sweep out the granular wax as fast as it is formed. Ray Amour was mistaken in saying that the wax of humblebees is formed out of pollen, and that it cannot be melted by heat. No doubt he mistook for wax the lumps of pollen moistened with honey, which are so often found in the comb. Three, perhaps four kinds of bees can be found within one nest in the height of summer. There are large females, which may be called queens, perhaps also smaller females, whose unfertilized eggs regularly produce males, workers, which rarely lay eggs at all, and males, or drones. The workers, unlike those of the hive bee, are not distinguished by any external peculiarities of structure. The numbers of the family are far inferior to those of the hive bee. A humble bee's nest, which contained 300 individuals, would be unusually populous. In spring, a queen, which has survived the winter, begins by herself to found a new community. Having chosen a spot to her taste, which may be either a hole in a bank or the bare surface of the ground, according to the habits of the species, she constructs a rude nest or shelter, lays a thin plate of wax, and deposits upon it a small heap of pollen mixed with honey. Upon this, one egg is laid. She then builds up a low cylindrical wall of wax, joined to the basal plate. Within this, more pollen and honey are stored, and additional eggs laid. The sides of the cell are then carried a little higher, and at length the top is carefully sealed. Other cells may be added to the first, with which, however, they are only slightly connected. After some days, the larvae hatch out and soon consume the food laid up for them. The queen then pierces a hole in the wall of the cell, passes her tongue in through the hole, and feeds the larvae carefully, closing the hole when the operation is finished. The numbers of the family increase very slowly, for the whole of the labor has at first to be performed by a single individual, but the first brood which hatches out consists of workers, who relieve the mother of a great part of her work. After they appear, the queen spends less time abroad and lays eggs more frequently. The first cells are constructed as early as February or March and contain comparatively few larvae. A few weeks later, the number of eggs laid in a single cell becomes greater. The food supply is then less adequate, and this may be one reason why the bees hatched in the height of summer are of smaller size. It has been said that the cells of late summer never contain any food, and that the grubs which they contain are fed exclusively from mouth to mouth. In autumn, special provision is made for the perpetuation of the race. New queens and a great many drones are hatched out. Egg-laying has by this time ceased altogether, and the rearing of new generations no longer employs the workers, which remain idle in the nest, seldom going out even to procure honey. 
the community does not long survive the close of the fine season. The nest, which is then devoid of food and brood, is deserted, and a few fertile queens, scattered about in holes in the ground, are the only humble bees which hibernate. It has been found that the economy of the humble bee is materially affected by climate. In the short summer of the Arctic Circle, they are said to produce no workers. The nests are very small, and we might almost say that the social state has been lost, the bees having returned to the solitary condition. On the other hand, in Mediterranean countries, the humble bees often survive the winter in considerable numbers, and the nests appear to be tending to a permanent state, such as is more fully attained in the hive bee. It was long ago stated by the old naturalist Goddard that in the early morning a sound is heard to issue from the nest of a humble bee, which he supposed to be a call, rousing the inmates of the nest to work. This statement, after having been long regarded as a fable, has recently been confirmed by several observers. It is found that the humming noise is due to the rapid vibration of the wings, and that if the bee told off for this work should be removed, another at once takes its place. The purpose of the sound can only be guessed at. Humble bees have many enemies, which sometimes devour not only the honey, but the bees as well. Among the number are ants, predatory flies, conops, caterpillars, rats, field mice, and weasels, to say nothing of schoolboys and mowers. There are many parasites, too, which sponge upon the nest, the most curious being the cuckoo bees, which, though unable by lack of special structures to collect pollen or make honey, are suffered by the humble bees to dwell in the nest and to take their share of the good things which have been stored up. Many solitary bees also are infested by their own species of cuckoo bees. The naturalist who has been able to acquaint himself with the habits of a solitary bee, such as Andrina, a humble bee of any species and the hive bee, will find himself in a position to make some interesting comparisons, or even to trace what may be called the growing civilization of social insects. He will see how bees may gradually associate themselves into permanent families, and families into little nations. He will see how the community, which in its simplest form is short-lived, is gradually enabled to last through more than one season, while in the more complex societies provision is made for the storing of food, a regular succession of generations, and the occasional emigration of new swarms. He will see how bees which were solitary and consisted of ordinary males and females only developed a caste of small females able to lay only unfertilized drone eggs, how these small females undertook more and more of the rearing of the young broods and became at last the workers and governors of the community. Social feeling, of which there could be none among the solitary bees, appears in all communities which include the offspring of more than one mother, and becomes intensified until in the hive we observe a division of labor and a subordination of private interest to the general good, which can only be paralleled in ant communities. Hardly less interesting is the steady improvement in the working implements of the bees, side by side with the growing complexity of their social state. Hairs, which are the only means which a solitary bee can employ to bring loose pollen to its burrow, become supplemented by pollen combs and pollen baskets. The mouth parts become prolonged so as better to explore the recesses of a flower, more efficient in suction, and more neatly folded when not in use. The rude materials employed for the constructions of solitary bees, such as sand, clay, or chewed leaves, become worked up with resin, vegetable wool, silk, and wax, and at last replaced by them. With wax comes the possibility of an architecture economical of material, space, and labor, even to the theoretical limit. Close and long-continued study of insect communities is not work for young naturalists. It is more profitable for them to start many inquiries and pursue each to the point at which the difficulties begin to be serious. The delight of pressing some one inquiry farther than it had hitherto been carried is not for them, but the future may have it in store for this or that individual. We should never forget that there may be a Rayamur or a Darwin among our pupils. End of chapter 49「Chapter fifty of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Mayall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Skeleton Lesson on Furs. A. Directions. 1. Draw a fresh branch of furs, about three inches long, of the natural size. 2. Make drawings on a larger scale of each distinct component of the same branch. 
three cut thin sections of a young branch and notice a the position of the stomates b the arrangement and structure of the vascular bundles four examine the flowers and make illustrative drawings five examine the pod and draw it both entire and burst open six on a hot sunny august day study the dispersal of the seeds seven collect a handful of the seeds in august and sow them in a garden border make a set of drawings at intervals to show the successive stages of growth b questions one classify the branches of firs or what appear to be such two how do branches of the year differ from older branches three what is the meaning of the grooves on the branches four why is firs spiny five where is carbon assimilation affected in firs six two species of firs sometimes more are often to be found growing together note such as are to be found in your own neighborhood and the marks by which they can be distinguished seven xerophytes are plants specially adapted to dry situations mention all the xerophytes which you know by personal observation eight what features do you find to be shared by firs and the common rush what are shared by firs and ling try to explain these resemblances nine what insects visit the flowers of firs? 10. What evidence can you supply of the derivation of firs from a leguminous plant of more ordinary type? End of chapter 50. Chapter 51 of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Museums and the Teaching of Elementary Natural History. The museum is a time-honored resource in the teaching of natural history. What can be more obvious than to preserve striking objects which are only met with at long intervals, arrange them methodically, and study them closely? What more obvious than to be guided in the choice of objects by experts who give their whole time to natural history? The saving of time and thought is immense. The teacher takes his pupils to visit a great collection, selected with infinite pains, and set out with professional skill. Surely he will do more in this way than if he makes a fresh beginning and tries to arrange a little collection of his own. The great public museum is perhaps too distant for frequent visits, and then the school is fired with the ambition of setting up collections of its own. The very effort will be wholesome. Surely everyone will cooperate in building up a museum which shall be to the private collections of the boys what the National Museum is to the little provincial museums. These are our expectations, and we get to work in good spirits. It is easy to start a school museum, and easy to carry it through the early stages of its development. Shells, fossils, bird's eggs, and the like come in freely, many of the specimens being drawn from private collections which have ceased to fascinate, or have been bequeathed to uninterested persons. When gratifying progress has been made for some years, and a great array of named specimens has been set out in due order, disillusion sets in. It is discovered that the museum interests very few persons, and is put, even by those few, to uses which can hardly be called intellectual. Sometimes, for instance, it is valued only as a means of getting the right names to put to the objects in a private collection without the labor of classification. Even then, the school museum may not have been entirely useless. Those who have worked at arranging and classifying will probably be the better for what they have done, but the school generations which inherit their labors will find in time that there is little for them to do but admire, and admiration of other people's work soon ceases to stimulate. Where then is the miscalculation? How is it that the method which seems so obvious fails to answer expectation? It is, I think, because an important factor has not received due attention. We have considered what zoology and botany and geology are, and how they can be logically cultivated, but we have not properly considered what the schoolboy is and what instruction he will accept or refuse. The untrained boy has many individual peculiarities, but two or three things are true of untrained boys in general. They hate copious details. They hate Latin and Greek names, and they are not warmly interested in dead animals and plants protected from all interference by plate glass. Not only schoolboys, but people of all ages, soon tire of being shown a multiplicity of objects of the same kind, all protected by glass. Clapered, an eminent and productive zoologist, has declared that les musées pesent lourdement sur la science. I should not be easily persuaded that this is generally true, 
and that our Natural History Museum at South Kensington, the Museum of Natural History at Brussels, the Hope Collection at Oxford, and the Manchester Museum are encumbrances, of which science would be well rid. Such museums as these secure the progress which zoological science has already made, and train experts who will carry that progress yet further. Instead of admitting that great and well-arranged museums weigh heavily on science, I believe that they should be yet more numerous, more extensive, and more completely systematic than in our day. But I am ready to admit that the nearer they approach to scientific completeness, the less fitted will they become for popular instruction. It may be thought practicable to divide the objects in a great public museum into two sets, one arranged to suit the convenience of experts, and the other adapted for popular instruction. I have little doubt that such a separation of the collections in any great public museum is prohibited by the circumstance that the visitors are not divisible into two distinct groups. There are intermediate students of many grades, everyone claiming recognition all the worse for the great public museum as a place of elementary instruction. In the school museum, this difficulty need not be felt, for only the wants of a limited and ready classified set of pupils have to be considered. It would be easy in the school museum to arrange long series of minerals, fossils, shells, birds' eggs, etc., in cabinets, and to display for elementary instruction only the things which can be made to tell their own tale effectively. Few of our public museums are effective for the purpose of popular instruction. One notable example is, however, before us. Our great natural history museum contains many series of objects judiciously selected and skillfully disposed for this very end. Teachers and classes who are near enough to pay frequent visits to the museum may study with every advantage impressive and self-explanatory collections, which will admirably reinforce the comparatively rough preparations made in the school or at home. One caution is necessary. The great museum contains such a wealth of striking objects that the risk of distraction is unusually great. Many short visits would be far better than a few prolonged ones. The pupils should be encouraged to see only a very few things in one day, and these all closely and naturally connected. Museum specimens are such things as skins, skeletons, models, and fossils. They do not show the plant or animal in action. This does not mean that they are of no real utility or interest, but it shows that no museum can suffice for the purposes of nature study. It must be largely reinforced by outdoor lessons, experiments on seedlings, daily observations on nest-building birds, insects undergoing transformation, and the like. There are instances, which I am glad to believe grow daily more numerous, of school museums which are brought together and arranged by the pupils. These, though far less complete, of course, than the museum made and arranged by grown-up people may be much more stimulating and more useful educationally. I can recommend also the temporary museum, made to illustrate a course of study actually in progress at the time. There need be no high standard of excellence for the admission of objects, and the naming and classification may be rough. The great thing is to enlist the hearty cooperation of many pupils. I do not expect great results from lectures delivered in front of the museum cases though they may be useful and stimulating at times. It has more than once happened to me to get a valuable lesson by accompanying a master of zoological science round a museum, and I recollect with keen pleasure a little lecture on Roman busts at the British Museum, which I was fortunate enough to overhear. There is no method so poor, but that it can be vivified by a powerful teacher. The museum can be no substitute for the class lesson, and its most costly treasures cannot replace the living plant or animal as the matter to be chiefly studied. If this is conceded, I have no further contention with the advocates of instruction in museums. We shall agree that the herbarium must not hinder us from studying the early purple orchis, growing in the pasture with its pollen masses ready to be removed, that the cabinet of fossils must not take the place of the fossil fresh chipped out of the quarry, and study together with the limestone in which it has lain so long. In general, the museum meets the wants, not of young pupils who are about to receive first lessons in the observation and interpretation of nature, but of the few who have already carried their studies beyond the elementary stage. It is a place for the storage of exact and detailed knowledge. I conclude, therefore, that while the usefulness of the museum in elementary instruction is limited, it is a most valuable and indispensable aid to the studies of the specialist. 
the usefulness of the museum as a means of popular instruction may be increased, but not indefinitely. It can never take the place of the class lesson. Nature study must rely on methods which work by the pupil, exercising his eyes, hands, judgment, independent observation, imagination, and love of doing, rather than on the lecture and the museum, which work for him and chiefly exercise his memory. End of chapter 51「Chapter fifty two of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Buttercups A Study of the Species. This discussion will be of interest only to those who have had some practice in classifying wild flowers and desire to understand the reasons for the system which they find in their books. Most of us think that we can tell a buttercup when we see it. If required to describe it from memory, we should probably say that it grows in pastures and meadows, that it has deeply cut leaves, and that its flower is a shallow cup composed of five glossy petals. Those of us who remember their school lessons in botany will be able to add that it has many stamens and many separate carpels. A good many different plants answer to this description, even when thus amended, and it is not easy to say which are to be reckoned true buttercups and which not. Does the reader know the two spearworts, the greater and the less? They grow in marshy places, and the flowers are very like those of a true buttercup. But the leaves differ. They are not cut into segments, but undivided. When the flower of a spearwort is closely examined, we find it resembles a buttercup not only in general structure, but even in details. Pull off a petal and examine its narrow base with a lens. You will find there a minute projection, which is a honey gland serving to attract the visits of insects. A similar gland is found just in the same place in every buttercup, and this fact strengthens the opinion that the spearworts, though they have peculiar leaves, may fairly be considered as particular kinds of buttercups. In ponds and slow streams, we often find growing in great abundance plants which have much resemblance to buttercups. The parts of the flower agree in every important respect, even to the gland at the base of the petal, but the petals are white instead of yellow. The leaves are usually of two kinds, floating leaves which are deeply cut, and finely divided submerged leaves which look almost like leaf skeletons. The old-fashioned name for these plants is water crowfoot. If we were to go by the flowers, we might consider these two as peculiar kinds of buttercup and call them water buttercups. Is the celandine which flowers so freely on shady banks in early spring a buttercup? It has undivided heart-shaped leaves. The sepals are usually not five, but three, and there are always more than five petals. But the celandine is of a bright yellow color, while it has numerous stamens and carpels, and even a honey gland and scale at the base of the petal, just as in a true buttercup. These examples show that it is not quite a simple matter to say what a buttercup is. If we judge by the leaves, we should be inclined to say that the spearworts and the celandine are not buttercups. If we judge by the color of the flowers, we should say that the water crowfoot is not a buttercup, but that the spearworts and celandine are. If we go by the stamens, carpels, and honey glands, we should call all of them buttercups. Botanists have generally taken this last course, and have made them into a single group, which they call a genus. We might call it the buttercup or ranunculus genus. We shall be obliged to alter our popular names a little if we wish to bring all the species of this genus under a single English name. There is much practical convenience in doing so, and we must try to find a good common name for the water crowfoot, the spearworts, the buttercups, and the celandine. The Latin name, ranunculus, is in general use. Shall we translate this by buttercup and apply that name to all the ranunculi? Then we may speak of the water buttercup, the two spearwort buttercups, the upright buttercup, the celandine buttercup, and so on. This will at least avoid confusion, though we may be sorry to spoil pretty and long-established popular names. The globe flower, Trolleus, which grows wild in some of our hilly districts and is often seen in gardens, looks like a buttercup too. The sepals and petals have much of the general appearance of those of a buttercup, and the stamens are quite similar, but there are a great many petals, and the carpels are not like those of a buttercup. They are only five in number, and instead of each containing a single seed, they are many-seeded. 
If we look closely at the honey gland, we find that it is not a prominence, but a sunk space. Here the difference from the buttercups, especially in the structure of the carpels, is so considerable that we may well hesitate to consider a globe flower a kind of buttercup. Hellebores have the same kind of carpels as the globe flower and must probably be associated with them. Can a wood anemone be placed among the buttercups? Not without spoiling the definition of the genus, for the six white leaves of the flower have no honey glands at their base. Indeed, there is reason to believe that they are not petals at all, but sepals, and that the true petals have disappeared. At all events, there is only one set of floral leaves. But since the anemones have numerous stamens and numerous one-seeded carpels, we must keep them near to the buttercups, if not in the same genus. What about the marsh marigold, Caltha, which looks very like an exaggerated buttercup? This too has no petals, but only petal-like sepals. There are many carpels, but they are not one-seeded. When ripe, they burst lengthwise and show a number of seeds within. Marsh marigold, too, would spoil the definition of the genus, if admitted, and by the structure of its carpels it is seen rather to belong to the hellebores, which have usually petal-like sepals, small petals, sometimes disappearing altogether, and many seeded fruits bursting lengthwise when ripe. Thus we recognize by the comparison of a number of flowers that there are outside the buttercup genus several allied species which cannot be included without spoiling the genus. Let us put them in a separate genera, the most natural that we can discover, and then associate all in one large assemblage. We might give the name of Ranunculus family to the large assemblage, which includes several genera. Ranunculus will, of course, be one of these. Clematis makes another distinct type, Anemone a third, and Hellebore or Caltha a fourth. All the British species of the buttercup family come near to one or other of these four types. It was only by degrees and after many failures that botanists came to recognize the buttercup family as a natural assemblage. Two hundred years ago, John Ray, the greatest naturalist of his age, put together the buttercups, the sinkfoils, and the strawberries, all of them being what he called polyspermous, that is, with many distinct carpels to one flower. Sinkfoils are often very like buttercups. They may have five sepals, five yellow petals, numerous stamens, and numerous carpels. Was Ray justified in placing them in the same family with the buttercups? Linnaeus turned them out again and put them in the same family as the roses and brambles. When he set up his classes and orders, based largely upon the number of stamens and carpels, the sinkfoils would have come naturally, together with all the buttercups, into his polyandria polygenia, but to this he would not consent. Taking advantage of the circumstance that the stamens of the sinkfoils, roses, brambles, etc., spring apparently, not really, from the calyx, he made them into a separate class, which he called Icosandria. Had he any right to do so? Why was he bent upon keeping them apart from the buttercups? If we could have put these questions to him, he would have answered, quote, There are natural groups which we cannot make but only recognize. Sinkfoils and buttercups belong to distinct natural groups. I see no close affinity between them and have carefully framed my definitions so as to keep them apart, unquote. This, you will say, is oracular and gives us no intelligible reason why sinkfoils and buttercups are not to be associated. Linnaeus had his reasons, but could not perfectly explain them, even to himself. Nevertheless, they were sound reasons, as all the later history of botany shows. Many arrangements of flowering plants have been tried since his day, but perhaps no one of them has put the sinkfoils and buttercups together. The modern classifier pictures the families to which they belong as two large islands in an ocean with no land passage from one to the other. Nothing would induce him to represent the sinkfoils as belonging to the buttercup island. If we are agreed as to our groups, it will be easy to find definitions for them. Plants belonging to the ranunculus family have distinct petals, numerous stamens springing from the top of the flower stalk, and separate carpels, whether few or many. Plants belonging to the ranunculus or buttercup genus have a gland on the petal and many one-seeded carpels. It will next be desirable to arrange the plants of the buttercup genus in the best order. 
One reason for doing this is that it is much easier to find the accepted name of any species if the descriptions are methodically arranged, but naturalists are not satisfied with an arrangement which is merely convenient for purposes of naming. They like to get what they would describe as a natural arrangement. It is not very difficult to divide the buttercups into small groups, which seem to be tolerably natural. We recognize, one, the water buttercups, which grow in or close to water, and have nearly always both floating and submerged leaves, besides white petals. Two, the spearwort buttercups, which have flowers both in form and color almost precisely like those of ordinary buttercups, but undivided leaves. Three, buttercups with deeply cut leaves and yellow flowers. Four, the celandine buttercup, with undivided leaves and flowers like those of other buttercups, except that the sepals and petals are more numerous. The water buttercup and the celandine buttercup are the most peculiar of the four sets, and it will be convenient to put one at the beginning, the other at the end of the series, while the spearwort buttercups and the ordinary buttercups may occupy a place in the middle. Let us now, for the sake of further practice, see how we can arrange all the species of these groups in a natural sequence. The leaves, as we have seen, distinguish the two spearworts, for in these two they are undivided, whereas in most other buttercups they are much cut. The great spearwort buttercup has large flowers, two inches across, and the leaves are not stalked. In the lesser spearwort the flowers are much smaller, and the leaves are borne on stalks. There are several common buttercups which can be distinguished from one another. We might divide them according to the form of the leaves, for no two are quite alike in this respect. This arrangement would bring out the existence of a pretty regular gradation in the shape of the leaves, but the gradation is so gradual that the groups would be ill-defined. The carpels differ in the different species. In some they are rough, while in others they are smooth. The flower stalks differ. In some they are furrowed, in others not furrowed. The sepals differ. In some they are bent back, reflexed, when the flower is open, in others they are spreading. Lastly, there is a difference in the honey gland. In some it is naked, while in others it is protected by a small scale. What organ shall we take as the basis of our primary division? Some botanists have said that the reproductive organs of the plant may be expected to yield more valuable characters than any other organs, and for the chief divisions of the buttercups, they would prefer characters taken from the carpels or stamens to characters taken from flower stalks or leaves. Some have said that convenience in naming is the chief or only consideration, others that it does not matter in the least where you get your characters if they yield natural divisions. The success of the division, they would say, has to be judged altogether by the greater or less resemblance in many small details of the associated species. We may make a beginning by remarking that the cell-relieved buttercup, Ranunculus scelaratus, is tolerably distinct from most other buttercups, and may come at one end of the series, near to the water buttercups and the spearworts, with which, however, it does not seem to be very closely related. The Goldilocks buttercup will have to be placed close to the upright buttercup, and this again must not be widely separated from the creeping and bulbous buttercups. There is a buttercup common in cornfields, which differs from the rest in its carpels and fruits, for they are few in number and covered with hooked spines. Another buttercup, the hairy buttercup, which is a very uncommon species, has its carpels roughened by tubercles, and the small flowered buttercup has rough carpels too. This, like the hairy buttercup, is seldom met with. It is not difficult then to divide buttercups into such as have smooth carpels and such as have rough or spiny carpels. Removing the buttercups with rough carpels from the rest, we have now left four species which cannot very well be defined by any positive characters. There are some obvious differences among them. For example, in the golden and the upright buttercups, the flower stalk is not furrowed. In the creeping and bulbous buttercups, it is. In the Goldilocks buttercup, as well as in the upright and creeping species, the sepals spread horizontally, whereas in the bulbous buttercup and in the three species with rough carpels, the sepals are reflexed or bent down when the flower is expanded. We can now apply these distinctions to get a classification which complies with our notions of affinity. 
of the four buttercups in question, two, the Goldilocks and the upright buttercup, have the flower stalk furrowed, and both have spreading sepals. The creeping and bulbous buttercups both have furrowed flower stalks, but in the creeping buttercup the sepals are spreading, while in the bulbous buttercup they are reflexed. We have now only to distinguish the Goldilocks buttercup from the upright buttercup, and this is not difficult. The honey gland at the base of the petal is covered by a small scale in all buttercups except the water buttercups, the Goldilocks buttercup, and the cell-relieved buttercup. This distinction will separate the upright buttercup, which has the scale, from the Goldilocks buttercup, which has none. Small differences like these make it possible to arrange all the buttercups in such a table as is given in every modern manual of British flowering plants. But no linear series can show all the relations which the botanist traces between these species. It is possible to make a nearer approach to a natural arrangement by grouping the species map fashion. Our list of buttercups shows us that a number of closely allied species, very similar in structure and mode of life, may exist side by side. Indeed, it is the rule, though not without its exceptions, that wherever we find a plant or an animal very abundant, it is accompanied by several nearly allied species. Chickweeds, clovers, sinkfoils, bedstraws, groundsels, thistles, hawkweeds, speedwells, docks, spurges, rushes, pondweeds, and sedges are familiar examples of the rule. Among animals, we might quote voles, warblers, owls, sandpipers, terns, gulls, houseflies, hoverflies, harlequin flies, gnats, etc. It is singular at first sight that many nearly allied species, all particularly numerous in individuals, should be able to exist in the same district. One would have thought that competition would speedily bring about a signal reduction of numbers, but such reduction is by no means inevitable. Human affairs, which have been more closely studied than the relations of animals and plants, show us why. Take any industry by which money has been made quickly and with apparent ease, such as the newspaper industry. We readily understand that where newspapers are profitable, newspapers will come to abound. Many will flourish side by side, even in the same city. To an observer ignorant of the language in which the newspapers are printed, they might seem very much alike. It will altogether escape his notice that the newspapers differ in price, in politics, and in the class of readers which they address, that one gives particularly good stock exchange news, that another has the confidence of farmers, and that a third describes football matches in language of uncommon vivacity. Our ignorance of the circumstances under which the buttercups compete with one another is almost total, but we may judge from their commonness that they enjoy special advantages over other plants. These advantages, whatever they may be, make it intelligible that several closely allied species should be able to flourish side by side. Moreover, our common buttercups, though very similar, are not quite alike even to the untrained eye. Sometimes we can assign no meaning to the differences which we observe. We do not know why some should have spreading, some reflex petals, some furrowed and some smooth flower stalks. But now and then we can see more or less distinctly the practical effect of a peculiar feature. We see that the upright buttercup, with its tall erect stem, will have the advantage in mowing grass. The creeping buttercup, with its numerous runners, the advantage in shallow, stony ground. Some buttercups are more acrid than others and deter more effectually the bites of animals. The corn buttercup ripens its nuts with the corn, and these nuts are spinous and clinging so that they are carried off with the sheaves, thrashed out with the grain, and sown with it next season. But how far are we from that kind of knowledge which would explain all the differences that we tabulate? The more ordinary buttercups, such as the upright buttercup, show by the simplicity, distinctness, and regularity of the parts of the flower that they are among the most primitive of flowering plants. Their very color is primitive, for yellow seems to be, next to green, the most primitive of flower colors. It is also, next to green, the most stable. The true buttercups do not deviate greatly from what we suppose to have been the original form of flower. The aquatic buttercups and the semi-aquatic cell-relieved buttercup have lost the scale to the honey gland. The aquatic buttercups have almost completely changed the original yellow on the petals to white, 
the celandine buttercup has reduced its sepals to three and increased the number of its petals. The small flowered buttercup has often fewer than the primitive number of petals. The stem and leaves show a greater variety of structure. The simple leaves of the celandine buttercup, which are probably primitive, usually become more or less cut. The creeping buttercup throws out long runners. The bulbous buttercup has a starchy swelling at the base of the stem. The celandine buttercup produces detachable tubers and bulbils so freely that it has come to depend upon them for dispersal and very rarely ripens its seeds. When we get outside the buttercup genus, ranunculus, and consider the far wider buttercup family, ranunculosily, the modifications of the flower become more important. We find enlarged nectaries, loss of petals, stamens reduced to five, carpels reduced to one, the nearly uniform yellow of the flowers changing to red, purple, and blue. The ranunculosily show in epitome the modifications which flowers in general have undergone in compliance with the tastes and habits of flower-haunting insects, in this case mostly bees and flies. Time would fail even to mention the countless adaptations of leaves, stems, and roots which are met with in the great buttercup family. What is the main purpose of a classification of plants or animals? The first systematists had very likely nothing in their minds beyond orderly arrangement. Even that excellent naturalist Ray could think of no better arrangement of plants at the time of his first treatises than an alphabetical one. Any orderly arrangement is of great service as a means of rapidly finding out what is known about a particular plant or animal. The view long prevailed, and is evident in many old systems, that the best arrangement of animals or plants was that which brought together such as agreed in their mode of life. Hence animals were classed as animals with or without blood, as hot-blooded or cold-blooded, as walking, flying, or swimming animals, and so on. Plants were divided into trees and herbs. Working naturalists came in time to perceive that it was bad classification to put bats near to birds, or whales near to fishes, or the crowberry near to the heaths, however striking the superficial resemblance might be. The principle of arrangement according to the organs of greatest physiological importance was defended long after it had been proved to be impossible in practice. For nearly two centuries it has been admitted that plants and animals must be classified according to their natural affinities. Nobody, however, could be got to explain what he meant by affinity. They talked much about affinity, and they really recognized it, but they could not say what it was. Every fresh systematist proposed his arrangement, which was praised as natural or blamed as unnatural, and in time opinion became fixed as to the primary groups, at least, although no logical basis of a natural classification had yet been discovered. In one important respect, the accepted systems infringed a universally admitted logical rule. Everyone agrees that whatever property is selected as the basis of an arrangement, it must be kept to throughout. In classifying books, you may go upon subject or size or alphabetical order of authors' names, but if you begin with one of these and afterwards change to another, you will get into hopeless confusion. Now this was just what the naturalists did, or seemed to do. Indeed, they discovered that the classifications which best satisfied their sense of affinity continually changed their basis. All classifications by characters taken from single organs, corolla, stamens, organs of circulation, organs of respiration, or whatever it might be, proved unsatisfactory. The increasing unanimity of naturalists on fundamental points showed, however, that whether they conformed to the rules of logic or not, they were in all probability making a nearer and nearer approach to scientific truth. Such was the state of matters fifty years ago when Darwin put forth his doctrine of the origin of species, which threw a flood of light upon the classification of plants and animals. Darwin gave reasons for believing that animals and plants, now quite distinct from one another, have often descended from a common ancestor. Affinity he interpreted literally as the result of common descent. Natural groups are collections of species whose likeness to one another is derived from common descent, and their unlikeness to other groups partly to the extinction of connecting forms which once existed partly to gradual divergence. Divergence among species is a form of division of labor. One buttercup, for instance, becomes adapted to life among long grass, 
another to dry stony ground, a third to life in cornfields, which are regularly reaped and sown again. The more closely they become adapted each to its own sphere, the more will they diverge from one another. We now regard the buttercups as plants which have diverged in comparatively recent times from one common ancestor, and this, if we could recover it, we should very likely pronounce to be a buttercup too. The gaps which separate the buttercups from one another, and the wider gaps between the buttercups and the anemones, or between the buttercups and the hellebores, we attribute mainly to the disappearance of connecting forms. The gap between the buttercups and the sinkfoils we believe to be far wider, and their common ancestor must date immeasurably farther back than either the common ancestor of all the buttercups or the common ancestor of all the sinkfoils. Darwin's theory of the origin of species shows that the principle of a natural classification of plants or animals is descent, near or remote, from a common ancestor. It may restore our confidence in logical principles or in natural classifications, whichever is shaken, to remark that the Darwinian explanation causes every natural classification of plants and animals, like every logical classification, to rest upon a single basis. End of chapter 52。r of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meol. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bit by Bit Invention Teeth and Scales. Whenever we are able to study closely the conversion of structures to new uses, we find that the process is gradual. This is in general true of human inventions, too, though the progress of man in the useful arts may far outstrip the slow and sure course of nature. But there are very few human inventions which are made suddenly, all at one time. Nearly always we find upon inquiry that they are founded upon ruder prototypes. A hastily cut log is put beneath the big stone, which has to be moved by a few hands. A second log is added to lift the stone clear of the ground, and then a third to shift to, while the first is being carried to the front. This completes the first stage of the new invention. The next thing is to fix the rollers permanently to the slow and heavy cart, hitherto dragged by main force over the fields. Then the rollers are increased in diameter and shortened in length. They become thin, transverse slices of trees, or built-up solid wheels, such as may still be seen in some eastern countries. The wheel with nave, spokes, and rim is harder to make, but it does not crack so easily, and it weighs much less. A rim of brass or iron gives additional strength. Then comes the smooth iron bearing, and the tire shrunk on by cooling. In the end, we get the locomotive wheel of compressed paper, with steel tire and self-acting lubricator, ready to run a thousand miles a day for years together. This bit-by-bit -bit discovery is just in the spirit of nature, though nature is slower than man, and her adaptations more exquisite. Every new idea is tested a thousand times over, and only adopted for good when approved by the most conclusive test the practical superiority of those who have it over those who have it not. To try all things and hold fast that which is good is the essence of natural selection. Let us work out one example as a parallel to the chain of discoveries by which the locomotive wheel has been attained. The fishes of the sea long ago found out the advantage of a nail-studded hide and were able to arm themselves with nails of suitable size and hardness developed out of the tissues of the inner skin. These nails had a broad base of attachment and a sharp point, generally pointing backwards towards the tail. The tip was often hardened by enamel, a contribution from the outer skin. Such nails made shark skin very hard to bite, and the unpleasantness of trying to bite it may be estimated by the fact that one old form of file, still used by cabinet makers, is made by wrapping shark skin round a stick of wood. The usefulness of these defenses led to further developments. In some cases, the broad base was enlarged and enlarged until it became a shield, protecting the softer parts within. Such a development we see in the bony plates of the head and flanks of a sturgeon. To the same origin may be traced the scales of common fishes, and even the bones of the top of the skull, most of which are what are technically called membrane or skin bones. The parietal and frontal bones, which protect the brain of man, can be derived by a long series of steps, from nails in the skin of a fish hard-pressed by greedy enemies. But the nails in the skin have given rise to another structure 
of quite different uses. On the lips, where the outer skin passes into the mouth, the nails changed their shape and grew long, dropping by degrees the wide plate at the base and becoming lodged in the jaws instead. At first the gums bore several rows of these altered scales, but the number gradually lessened as the size grew, and at last we see what slow and gradual change can effect. The teeth of a quadruped, large, strong, and tipped with enamel, are simply one extreme form of the primitive nails in the shark skin. By leaving out the central prong and developing the base, membrane bones have been attained. By leaving out the basal plate and developing the prong, teeth have been formed. When the invention of teeth became a practical success, it was perfected in a thousand different ways according to the various needs of toothed animals. We now find conical pointed teeth, bayonet-shaped teeth, saw-edged teeth, which enlarge the wound and avoid jamming, chisel-shaped teeth, which by means of the unequal hardness of their constituents keep always sharp, teeth with rounded studs for crowns, pavement teeth, and folded teeth with ridges and hollows of unequal hardness so that they never wear smooth. The anglerfish has hinged teeth, which bend inwards easily, but cannot be forced outwards, and detain the struggling prey as in a trap. The pike has a whole mouth and gullet crowded with teeth. The male narwhal has only one functional tooth, but this is several feet long, half the length of the body. Not less various are the situations in which teeth are developed. The edges of the jaws are the places usually chosen, but the roof of the mouth is often armed with teeth also. Some fishes which swallow their prey whole have backward pointing teeth, projecting from all parts of the mouth. Even the gill arches, bony and jointed hoops, primarily intended to spread out the gill filaments, are made to bear teeth. And the last gill arch in many fishes loses its respiratory character altogether, becoming transformed to a single or double tooth-bearing plate which underlies the gullet. The upper parts of other gill arches may also expand into broad tooth-bearing plates steadied by attachment to the skull. In some fishes, the lower plate plays upon the upper one and forms together with it a pharyngeal mill able to grind up the food. Where a highly peculiar instinct calls for the development of teeth in a quite unexpected place, the adaptation of some structure originally intended for a different purpose may be of startling singularity. Wherever there is epiderm, or its equivalent, enamel can be developed. Wherever there is derm, inner skin, or its equivalent, dentin can be developed. And these two things are the ordinary components of teeth. But the tooth must also have a supporting base, and it is here that the greatest ingenuity is displayed. A certain African snake, the Dasapeltis, or egg-eater, of the Cape Colony, lives upon eggs. This food is no doubt both wholesome and agreeable, but it is not without its difficulties. If the snake breaks the egg before eating it, what becomes of the yolk? If it eats the egg before breaking it, what becomes of the shell? Dasapeltis calls to its aid the outstanding processes of its neck vertebrae. These were primarily intended to serve for the attachment of muscles, but now they are made to change their directions and to stand forward through the muscles into the throat. They become tipped with enamel like true teeth. Dasapeltis swallows the egg whole, breaks it in the gullet by its vertebral teeth, and when the contents are swallowed, discards the shell. Human invention has this great advantage over what we are compelled to call the invention of nature, that it can readily take shortcuts. When man has once laid hold of a real improvement, all the steps by which that improvement was attained become a mere matter of antiquarian curiosity. When the light wheel, built up of nave, spokes, and tire, has once been got, we give up cutting sections of tree trunks. But nature goes back to the beginning time after time, stages of development long superseded, may be abbreviated or disguised, but they are not quickly lost. The higher animals begin their individual lives as simple cells, very like, at least superficially, to amoebae, or to the cells which compose the colonies of the lowest protozoa. In the further course of their development, they may reproduce as transitory structures, organs which they have never actually used since the time when the Silurian rocks were forming. Fresh organs are nearly always made by giving a new shape to old ones. Hence the patient ingenuity of nature is fettered by a load of tradition, and not a few structures which we perceive to be exquisitely fitted for their place were originally meant for something else. The development of every animal is a condensed history of adaptations. End of chapter 53
Chapter Fifty Four of House, Garden, and Field by L. C. Meal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Great examples. If any of us were called upon to name the greatest biologists of the nineteenth century, we should not go far wrong if we chose Charles Darwin and Louis Pasteur, for the work of these two men has profoundly affected both thought and practice. Many days can hardly pass without the biologist or the physician to say nothing of the chemist, having to recall some investigation by Darwin or Pasteur, relating it, maybe, to the cross-fertilization of flowers, the movements of plants, climbing plants, the descent of man, the supposed spontaneous generation of living things, the nature of fermentations, the role of minute organisms in disease, or the prevention of diseases caused by minute organisms. The labors of Cuvier, Humboldt, Robert Brown, Johannes Müller, Bayer, Bernard, and Owen are forever memorable, but even these men did not, like Darwin and Pasteur, act powerfully upon the whole generation of scientific workers among whom they lived. It is remarkable that neither the one nor the other was a professed biologist. After returning from the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin must have considered himself a working geologist. After the monograph on the Cirripedes, he must have considered himself a working zoologist and after the treatises on orchids, climbing plants, and insectivorous plants, he must have considered himself a working botanist, but always with considerable reserves. In his own eyes, Darwin ranked as a self-taught, half-trained man, needing at every turn the advice and help of regular students. Pasteur, though he had the courage to discuss disease among physicians and to set the physicians right, though he identified many obscure organisms and investigated their mode of life, had always to disclaim the attainments of the biological specialist. Neither Darwin, with his past degree, nor Pasteur, with his purely chemical and physical education, would have had early in his career a chance in any biological competition. Biological textbooks, lectures, and museums had little or no share in making them what they were. Both were eminent observers and experimenters. Both, I imagine, if interrogated as to the secret of their productiveness, would have attributed it mainly to the habit of independent observation, reflection, and verification by experiment. Genius, we may be told, is an exception to all rules. I, for one, do not admit this as an axiom. Genius conforms to certain generalizations from ordinary human experience. Their ancestry and their associates helped to make Darwin and Pasteur what they were. Nor, though they stood out higher by the head and shoulders than the other eminent biologists of the century, did they fail to show the qualities which bring success to smaller men. Perseverance, candor, and trust in scientific inquiry are among the ordinary virtues of all deserving men of science. In Darwin and Pasteur, these virtues were carried to the heroic point. I do not quite believe that Darwin's and Pasteur's come among us like lightning from heaven. There are surely reasons why they should appear in some ages and some nations and some families, but not in others. Whether we can by taking thought make such men more frequent is not adequately proved. But since the lower degrees of their qualities are clearly beneficial and to some extent capable of cultivation, it would be wise to encourage these lower grades wherever they show themselves. Among the lower and ordinary manifestations of those qualifications for biological discovery which became illustrious in Darwin and Pasteur, I should reckon curiosity, the habit of observation, and the habit of experiment. We shall certainly not spoil any unrecognized Darwin or Pasteur by giving opportunity for the exercise of these propensities, and we may possibly favor the production of genius. Nature study seeks, above all things, to develop the earliest rudiments of the scientific discoverer. It does not aim at making zoologists or botanists or professors or honor men, but would strengthen, if it could, curiosity about nature, the habit of observation, and the habit of experiment. End of chapter 54 End of House, Garden, and Field A collection of short nature studies by L. C. Meal